Hello, everybody. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, can you guys hear me? Can you write in the chat if you hear me? A lot of chat. Great. Okay. Hi. So welcome to Mass 7502. Um, I'm Yoni Nazarethi. You've gotten quite a bit of correspondence from me already. Um, Let's see, you are seeing now, uh, let me just see what you're seeing. It'll take me just another sec, hold on. All right, you can see what's called my desktop too. Um, so I assume you can see the course website, uh, right? The Math 7502 course website. Um, and this is, this is where most of the information for the course is. Um, I'll describe quite a few things. Um, don't, don't hesitate to um, stop me at any point with questions um, or, um, or anything, really. And you can ask questions either by voice or by chat. Uh, the chat I sometimes don't see, um, just because there's too much, uh, too much electronics happening around. Um, for me. So, um, all right, Mass 7502. Before I start, let me just ask, so who here has done Mass 7501? Just bombard the chat with a yes. Uh, it's not that I'll get, I'll get an official count, but there are people here who have done Mass 7501. Yes, some names I know. Um, okay. And um, as those yeses are coming through, so who has not done Mass 7501? Go ahead and bombard with a no. Don't say yes, I've not done, because I'll mix with that yes. All right, good. So we have a mix. Um, and um, I have not. 
Uh, okay, great. All right, so we've got we've got some that have and some that haven't. And who here is in uh, their first semester? I mean, I, I got your uh, voice messages from quite a bit of you, and I enjoyed them. Thanks a lot. But who's in the first semester? Just just say hi, 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 or something like that. So you've just started. So this is basically the first day of your study. And you said hi, hi, hi. Somebody said hi, 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 three times. All right. So uh, welcome to the <laughs> first semester. Welcome, welcome to your first course. Um, now, I sent an email, I believe I did, uh, correct me if I didn't, uh, about makeup material for those of you who didn't do Math 7501, which is kind of this background information. Um, I assume that you saw that email. Um, so there will be a few students that have not done Math 7501 and also uh, maybe have not done a whole lot of mathematics previously. Maybe you did a degree in... Um, in business administration or something like that. Um, there will be students that have not done Math 7501, um, but have done quite a bit of mathematics in your engineering degree maybe a decade ago or something like that. Um, for both of these cohorts, you might want to spend a bit of time on this paragraph. Uh, you can see this paragraph I'm highlighting in the website. Um, somehow, I'm, I, can you see my screen? I'm not sure if you can. Yeah, okay, thanks for that. Okay. Um, now, very important is this, is this first year learning center. So um, don't hesitate to head over there uh, virtually or perhaps in person, I'm not sure, but I, th I think it's more, it's more virtually to this first year learning center. Um, and there you can also get a bit of help and I've guided the tutors there on how to help you with general things. So basically, for Math 7502, I'm assuming that you know basic calculus, uh, derivatives and integrals, although we won't have so many of those. I'm assuming that you've worked with matrices and vectors to some level, although today we'll do a review of matrices and vectors. Um, and I'm assuming that you can understand the language of sets and, and some logical reasoning, but not at the same hardcore level in which it was in the first few unit, units of Math 7501. So this is a first year learning center. I don't know why it can't be reached. That's a bad sign. Um, let's grab that. But, uh, and here is your course reader. I wonder if there's somehow too much load from the screen sharing on my internet. I don't think that would be the case. Um, Hmm, maybe there is. Okay, maybe somehow this screen sharing from this big screen is, is messing things up. Uh, let me actually stop the share a second. And I will just, so I'm, I'm working with two screens. So I will move to the, sorry, these are the growing pains of online. Um, I will try to share the smaller screen. And maybe that would be, uh, so I, I assume you can see my website again. Um, right, so can, you can see the website now. Um, you can see screen, thanks. All right, so, and let's see now. So again, you've got this, uh, this first year learning center, um, which still doesn't seem to want to open uh, really well. Okay. I'm not sure what's happening here. And this is the course reader. Maybe there's actually something wrong with that domain momentarily. That's, that would be surprising, but let's, let's just try a different link just for a second. Sorry. Um, I'll hit, uh, let's say, um, let's say this. Yeah, I think that's working. Somehow at this moment of time, the uh, web servers of the School of Mathematics and, Sur uh, Mathematics and Physics decided not to work. Not sure why. It's not coming. Okay, let me go back to the start of the course. So Math 7502, uh, I'm Yoni. We've got tutors, uh, Sam and, and Wella. Uh, you will meet the tutors in the practicals on Thursdays. So there are two practicals on Thursdays, but they're identical. So you can do practical one or practical two. And what we're going to try to do is in the same practical to accommodate both of you that uh, both both 
cohorts, the cohorts that are in flexible delivery and the cohorts that are in external mode, okay? <coughs> so both cohorts together. Um, and we, we're recording uh, everything. By the way, let me check to, just that I'm recording now. Oh, okay, so I said Blackboard is down. Okay, all of UQ is down, but we're continuing. That's good. Uh, and it says that we're recording as well. So that's good. Maybe something happened. Maybe the whole world is down and we'll just continue studying linear algebra independently. That's possible, by the way. It can be not a bad outcome. All right. So outside of the um, Zoom lectures, you've got the Piazza. There was all, already some communication there. And the Blackboard site, I'm basically using for messages and for your grades. Uh, when you Google Mass 7502, you get to last year's course, which is this guy, um, right? So make sure not to use this guy. But you've got quite a lot of useful information there. Last year was slightly different, different assessment, et cetera, but I assume some of you already looked at last year's course. Um, the course profile, let's see if this is down. Of course, course profile is important. Uh, course profile is the, no, that seems to be up. So that's the contract, whether you're in flexible delivery or external delivery, that's a contract between uh, you and the University of Queensland, basically in the course. And it says, this is a course, you do this course, you get these and these grades, and how do these grades work? So you go to assessment. Um, and this is, these are the assessment items for the course. Um, so basically three quizzes that you'll be doing uh, in, by yourself during lecture time at home. Um, so these simulate a, an in-class quiz. Okay, these are three quizzes uh, and um, two home assignments and then a final project. This final project is due during exam period. Okay, and these are how the weights um, are distributed. Are there any questions about this? Okay. So that's, that's, that's how uh, course profile works. And that's basically the, we don't need to speak about that pretty much ever again. That would be quite straightforward. Um, now, what's this course about? Well, you guys are on the way to be data scientists. Um, some of you from your recordings I heard are already working in fields adjacent uh, to data science or pretty much in data science. Uh, and some of you are not in that sign. Um, here you will learn um, the basic mathematics that's used uh, for a whole bunch of algorithms in data science dealing with uh, multiple variables, with many variables. And uh, that's basically linear algebra, linear algebra and a bit of extensions, okay? So it's linear algebra and some multivariable calculus, okay? Uh, but mostly linear algebra. Now, it's, it's important that we kind of speak about 12 use cases. This is not your classic linear algebra course where the lecturer does Gaussian elimination and then you learn about the null space and the rank and independence of vectors and then you do eigenvalues and eigenvectors and you do vectorizations and so mathematical. I mean, that exists in the course, uh, but not at the full rigor. Not at the full rigor because what we're getting instead is uh, we'll try to aim these 12 use cases, <coughs> which are very big. And data science. Uh, so if you understand the mathematics between these 12 things, you understand quite a lot. Um, where, where is deep learning in these, in these 12 things? Which, which one of these 12 things kind of uh, is the workhorse for uh, deep learning? Is it clustering? Is it the convergent proof of the perceptron? Is it least squares? Or is deep learning? Take a bit of a guess. I mean, I assume most of you have heard of deep learning, kind of neural networks, uh, artificial intelligence, as it's sometimes called uh, deep learning. Which one? Principal component analysis, maybe. Which one is deep learning? Which one is kind of uh, related to deep learning? Not that that's the most important thing, but that's uh, certainly a hot topic. Uh, descent, right, thank you. So. The gradient descent is pretty much the, it's a very simple algorithm, and we already had this for those of you that, that did Mass 7501, you spoke about Mass 7501. Here we could do a bit more analysis of gradient descent, and that's related to deep learning that you might do in other courses, okay? This is the background. Um, now, I kind of like to use these uh, types of uh, resources and call them, use these acronyms, okay? So these are the resources which we have. Uh, 
Some of them are books, some of them are videos, some of them is software, some of them are some websites that I've, I've kind of created for this. Um, so a core resource is core linear algebra with Julia, which is cloud, okay? Um, and if you go to this URL, just this link, uh, that's core linear algebra with Julia. This is basically the linear algebra that you're going to study for this course. And uh, today we're, we'll get a start, uh, we'll push forward on, on unit one. So there are basically six units here, um, and it's quite an extensive uh, list of things that we'll touch and study. Um, very dry, so no, no data science in this representation in core linear algebra with Julia. Now, um, I will put these things, and I think the first one for today is already on, on this GitHub repo, which is linked from there. Um, so this, this, is, this is a course's GitHub repo. Um, who here has a GitHub account? Just kind of let me know, I, 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 if you'd like. Um, so it's, there's some, and who doesn't? Does somebody not have, which is perfectly fine too. So I don't have, say no, no, I don't have, no, I don't have. Now you've gone to single letters. You're conserving bad wind. Okay, you've got two letters for now. Okay, right. So um, get a GitHub account. You don't need a GitHub account to use this, uh, and that's fine that you don't, right? But as a, as a data scientist, you you might as well uh, start working with uh, with GitHub. It's the most common um, source control platform. Um, I think that maybe in data seven thousand and one, you'll be kind of having a few discussions on how to use GitHub. Um, but here you just need to be a user and you can download things. So you don't need to even uh, commit and push, you just download stuff. Okay, so this is, uh, this for example is a notebook that we'll deal with today in core linear algebra. So that was accessible from here. And uh, I guess, let's go back to the main course website. And that, that was core linear algebra. Data science use cases. Um, so these are these 12 uh, very cool use cases uh, that you know you should feel good about for the fact that you're studying um, linear algebra. Um, so Lalith is asking, all are done in Jupyter? Most of the things I'll do in Jupyter. Yeah, so you can work with Julia. I'll speak about Julia extensively soon and we'll do a lot of Julia today. You can work with Julia in the REPL or in the um, Julia Pro, which is Juno and Atom. I'll use Jupyter Notebooks and, and it's the most common and accessible thing for this type of application that we're doing, kind of running with things forward. In Introduction to Data Science, that some of you have done last semester and some of you uh, are doing this semester, you're using a lot of Jupyter Notebooks as well with Python. The acronym of Jupyter is Julia Python R, something like that. Okay, so the thing, second thing, data science use cases, um, these are those 12 guys uh, with a bit more information, and this will grow. This will grow. Now, uh, in, for certain ones, you have like links to books, and the, those sections of the books are, should be available to you. They're either scanned by the library or, um, or the book is free if it's VMLS. Okay, so like this is, uh, this is VMLS chapter nine, that book is available, and this is a book ILA, Introduction to Linear Algebra, section 6.3, that's accessible, etc. So that's the second resource. Uh, the third resource, Julia. Um, so I believe that most of you have battled installing Julia over the weekend or the days before, um, some of you maybe still have not. Um, so Julia is the programming language that will be the official programming language of this course. Now, if you prefer to work in Python and that's your thing, work in Python, fine. If you prefer MATLAB, work in MATLAB. Um, if you wanna write everything in assembly, um, go ahead and do that too, okay? Um, you can use any language you'd like, but the one I will use and the one that's kind of, in a sense, most recommended or more, most connected to the course is Julia. You'll see that a few other similar courses taught in other universities in the US and elsewhere have also connected to the Julia language. Um, the main point about the Julia language, and let me just explain that for a sec. So I'll, I'll go a second here to um, this reference and open this book draft. So, so this, is, this is my book draft um, with Hayden Clock dealing with Julia. But if, if you go here to 
Of course, you don't need to read this whole book for this course. The book deals more with statistics as opposed to linear algebra. But just so you kind of understand a thing or two about Julia. So in general, from the programming language, you'd like, uh, well, you'd like multiple things, but you basically want to achieve your task quickly. And for that, uh, well, maybe you're interested in run speed. That's important if your task has a lot of computation, or maybe you're interested in development speed. And that's important if your task is hard to develop and is not so simple as just adding two numbers. Uh, these languages here are great for development uh, speed. They're called uh, they're kind of high level scripting languages in a sense. And these ones here, notably uh, C and maybe Fortran a bit more classically, sometimes Go and maybe a few others are more run speed. Java kind of sits there also, sort of, okay? And you've got this curve and it's a Pareto optimal frontier. It's kind of the, you know, you're, if you're paying, if you want more run speed, you're paying with development speed and vice versa. Julia attempts to push this just a bit forward. So it feels kind of like Python and MATLAB, kind of a combo of Python and MATLAB. In Python, you have to work with NumPy, which is kind of a plugin for Python for working with vectors and numbers because everything in Python is a list. Um, if, you, if you don't say that word. Uh, or sorry, the collections are generally lists. Um, and, you know, Julia kind of, feels like MATLAB when it comes to matrices, which is quite natural. But the thing is, it's almost as fast as C. And it does this by being a compiled languages and having types. Um, so ideally, uh, things can be written uh, in one language, whereas often when you run things in Python or R, they've been implemented uh, underneath in C or Fortran, if they're computation intensive. So in this sense, Julia solves the two language problem. So that's kind of the main story of Julia. Okay, so that's a Julia programming language. And by the way, just like an hour or two ago, there was an announcement that Julia 1.5 is released. I assume most of you installed Julia 1.4, that's fine. Even 1.0 is pretty much fine. Okay, that's Julia. Any questions about Julia? I'm sure there are. Now, feel free to ask questions uh, with using voice as well. Okay, so when you install Julia, you need to install, you need to be able to run Jupyter Notebooks. Okay. All right, let's move on. So the next reference is VMLS. That's his great book. Um, so there's a question by Molly, should we use desktop Jupyter? It doesn't matter, any, any Jupyter pretty much. You can use Jupyter Lab. Uh, you can do what I'm doing, you'll see soon, which is uh, an Anaconda version of, uh, of Jupyter. Uh, you would have need to install the iJulia, like I sent in the video. Um, I'm happy to help people with that specifically. You can meet me in this visit hour, Friday, 11 to 12. But also the tutorial, this, this, the practical this week, this Thursday, we'll also just focus on Julia. Uh, if somebody's having extreme trouble, just send me, send me an email uh, as well with installing Julia. Or ideally, you can help each other via the Piazza. Ah, very important. Uh, helping each other is a great thing. It really is. I mean, this is, this is one of the great things you can do in this course is meet other people to help uh, to and to get help from. Uh, often the computer science type and the mathematician type kind of can interface and help each other. Um, and uh, of course, we, we don't often meet face to face. Uh, some of you I won't meet, unfortunately, face to face this whole semester because you're even overseas. Uh, but joining to help each other, and you can use Piazza for that or any other platform, is useful. Installation of Julia is kind of a classic thing. You can do it with the homework, homework as well, and we'll get to that. There's kind of a boundary between helping each other and plagiarism. Uh, there's a way to do that. You don't want to plagiarize. Does this course require Mathematica? No, it does not. So Math 7501, the course in the previous semester, the official programming language of the course was Mathematica because uh, it's a symbolic math, uh, language and it was kind of natural for that course that dealt with integrals and a bit of kind of manipulation of expressions and things like that. But no, we don't need to use Mathematica. Again, you can, you can use any software you'd like for the course, uh, but Julia is a recommended one. Um, okay, I don't see more questions. 
All right, the book VMLS. This book is a great book. Uh, it's a bit of an elementary book, but actually uh, not fully. So it doesn't have everything that we have in the course material, and it has some a few things that, that are not in the course material. I mean, look, the name is very elementary, vectors, matrices, and least squares. Um, however, it's just beautifully written, and um, I recommend just, just whizzing through it, uh, because you can. It's, it's actually, you know, you can get to chapter 10 quite, quite quickly. Um, so up to chapter 10, a, a good part of the material, oops, what is this called? A good part of the material is uh, is what I suggest as background. So these are the sections from VMLS that I suggested as background. Those that did Mass 751 don't have to do that. Those that did not do Mass 751, have a look at these sections. Um, some of them we'll cover today as well. Okay, the book has much more because the LS is least squares. Uh, you can order the book. Notice that the book has a Julia language companion. Uh, so this guy, Professor Stephen Boyd from Stanford, a very well-known uh, professor, one of the authors of the book, you know, is kind of one of the um, pushers of Julia. Okay, uh, LA, LFD, Linear Algebra Learning from Data. So that's this book. Uh, last year I asked the students to uh, buy it. This year, I'm not asking you to buy it. First of all, it's just very hard to buy a book and to get it shipped. And anyway, buying a book is expensive. Still, you can order the book if you'd like. Uh, this one, I think, does not have an electronic version, uh, LALFD. Uh, there's these two copies in the library. Of course, this is only relevant to students that are here. But the UQ library also scanned the critical sections here. So if you go to this link, uh, those critical sections, especially related to the use cases. So you go to Mass 7502. Um, so with a, with a book, we're allowed to scan up to 10%. And there's a, see, there's a few sections that are directly related to, um, to those data science applications that we'll be celebrating. Okay, so that's it. Am I in the right place? How do I get back? Okay, here. Next book, Introduction to Linear Algebra. So this is a much more classic book. Uh, you can also get it in university bookstore. And again, there are two sections. This is this book. Uh, if somehow you have a version that's not the fifth edition, no big deal. The big uh, difference in the fifth edition is that the singular value decomposition, um, but no big deal. Okay, so these are basically the three main books. Uh, this video series by 3Blue1Brown, uh, excellent video series. I'll refer to some videos uh, for you to watch. I'll basically suggest for you to watch <coughs> prior or after to the lecture. Uh, and this statistics with Julia book. So this is not a book directly related to the course material, but you have, that's, uh, that's my co-authored book and, and you have the draft version online um, with the exception of two chapters, I think. Um, but you, you have example of, examples of how to do quite a lot of things with, with Julia there. Although it's not the key reference, even though today we'll use code snippet from that book. Question about these uh, materials. Okay, this is taking a bit of time. All right, uh, these are links to these guys, uh, which are not populated yet. Um, and here is how to hand in uh, homework. I, I think this is very clear and I already got an audio clip from a good part of you today. Thanks for that. Those who haven't, please feel free to send your clip. Um, the idea about this recording is uh, it's kind of a you taking ownership for your quiz or for your um, uh, assignment or for your final project. Uh, but today it was very nice to hear your audio clips. And here's a schedule. So we're here, we two two point five 2.5 hours every Monday evening. So basically I think what um, I'll do, unless, unless somebody pushes me strongly to do a different schedule. So it's like I do in face-to-face -face lectures. So 50 minutes, 10 minutes, 50 minutes, 10 minutes, 50 minutes, and it'll be 7.50 PM uh, here in Brisbane. Here in Brisbane, we go to sleep very early. 7.50 PM by 8 PM, got to be in bed. So we have 10 minutes to go to bed. All right, so that's, uh, that's the lectures. Uh, the quizzes will be during the lecture. So they'll be for about an hour, but you'll have a bit more time to prepare. And then in the practical, you see, you'll see a solution to the quiz in the same week of the quiz, et cetera. Uh, you've got your assignments due here. You've got the final project due after the semester. This is a public holiday, so it's a Monday. Uh, so there's no lectures. So basically we only have 11 weeks with lectures, okay? 
we got 11 weeks with lectures. And there's what's called a semester break and nothing happens. Questions about that? No. All right. Good. I think we can get to business. So anything else I needed to cover? No. Nope. All right. So what I'll do, I was actually running this. I'll, I'll, I'll shut this down. And so you see it, you see it starting again. No, don't want to do that. Um, shut this. You don't care about this. Um, uh, okay, so the way I start Ju Julia is I, I do Jupyter Notebook. Now, of course, you can get Julia. So most of you would have Julia in the REPL. So this is a Julia REPL, right? Where REPL stands for Read, Evaluate, and Print Loop, where you can do Julia commands. Some of you will have Julia Pro, uh, which is this type of thing. Okay, and it might it might be more convenient for you to work with Julia Pro or the REPL. Uh, but I'm running with Jupyter. This is what Julia Pro looks like. Um, but I'll quit that. So Julia Pro is inside the Atom editor. Uh, so this thing is just a shell. Uh, and what I do is Jupyter Notebook after I've installed it and it launches. Um, you can also launch Notebook from the REP. Okay. So it launches a local um, server. And uh, this is kind of the base directory where I, where I launched Jupyter Notebook. And then I'll go to the uh, core linear algebra with Julia folder. And I'll open this first guy. And I think what will happen is during the lecture, uh, we will add to it and uh, make it uh, also play around with it. Okay. So that's basically our, our, our unit one, uh, vectors, matrices, inverses, determinants, a whole bunch of things. This is kind of the mishmash of, of reviewing a few things from 7501 and doing a few new things, hardly anything really new here, but also dealing with uh, in this specific day today uh, in comparison to mass 7501, but also dealing with uh, Julia. Now, who, who has used Jupyter Notebooks? Throw a bit of yeses if you can. Right, and that list probably intersects with people that have also done data 7001. Uh, and who hasn't? I'm sure that people haven't. Okay, good, haven't. All right, so Jupyter Notebook is kind of like, I'm not sure it'll be presented like this to you in, in, uh, in, in um, data 7001. The Jupyter Notebook is kind of like the VI editor. So, uh, well, it might, might be that some of you have not used Unix before and that's fine, but there, there's an editor that used to be very popular and it's VI. Okay, today it's Vim, uh, kind of a bit more improved. Um, and, you know, this editor is not like your normal editor, you don't just type. At the moment, if I press something on the keyboard in this editor uh, that you see, then it won't type, it'll do a command. Okay, to start to type, I'm gonna press I. And you see it put this little insert. You don't need to know this. I'm just kind of giving you a bit of background. And then I can say, hello class. And then I'm gonna hit the escape key and it moved from edit mode into command mode. And then I can use the keyboard for commands. For example, B, B, move, B each time moves a word back and W word moves the word forward. Okay, or D, W deleted a word, etc. Or escape, colon, quit, exclamation mark, quit. We don't need to know VI. But I'm just showing you VI because Jupyter Notebooks are kind of the same. They have what's called a command mode. If I hit the escape key, you can't see this, but I hit escape key on my keyboard, then now I can do all kinds of commands. For example, if I do A, the command A inserts a cell above, okay? They're cells, so individual parts of the Jupyter Notebook. This is the whole Jupyter Notebook, okay? The individual bits are cells, okay? Or escape and the command X deleted the current cell. Okay, and then I can insert and then I edit stuff. So now I'm in edit mode. Okay, escape, I'm in command. So same type of thing. If you want to see all the commands, you can click here and you get a list of the commands. Okay, basically I just use A for cell above, B for cell below, X for delete, M for changing a cell to markdown. Now what's this markdown? 
who here know has heard of Markdown or well, the difference between hear, hearing about Markdown and knowing Markdown is, is, is marginal, is very small. Who has heard slash knows Markdown? Markdown. <laughs> Markdown. Somebody has. What is the command you tell the REPL to open Jupyter? In the REPL uh, model, you would do notebook. Um, that's assuming that you've installed iJulia. I didn't do it in the REPL, I did it in my shop. So who has heard of marked, Markdown? Okay, yes, yeah, so we have a yes, uh, no problem. So, all right, and some of you haven't. Well, Markdown is this formatting language that looks kind of like this. This is plain text, okay? And it doesn't have a whole lot. It has this kind of hash, that means kind of a, a heading. And then you can put like one and it'll mean a bulleted list. And you can also put a few other things. I think you can put like star and you could say bold stuff. And it will mean, or maybe star star is bold stuff. It will mean that things are bold, etc. And if I wanna see what the cell looks like, I'm gonna hit shift enter. And I formatted now the cell. See, you see, it kind of looks nice now. So this is the raw markdown cell. This is a raw markdown cell. And this is how it looks formatted. So Jupyter notebooks uh, involve basically two main types of cells. A cell can be a markdown cell or a code cell. So if I now open a new cell above, here above unit one, and I'll do one plus one, this is a code cell. You see it has this in and in. And I'm gonna do shift enter. And Julia Carl is now thinking, oh, <laughs> one plus one. Yeah, you can do it, Julia. I told you it's a fast language. It's fast. No, it's not so responsive sometimes because you need to kind of load things. It actually compiled one plus one. But second time, it's going to be very fast. It now remembers one plus one. It's good. All right. So you see, this is a code cell. I can go to the cell menu and do cell type and change it from code to markdown, code markdown. Forget about raw and be converting now. Code and markdown. Okay. So my Jupyter notebook cells basically involve code and markdown. Okay, let me delete this bold stuff. Okay, and that's, that's kind of how it works. Important thing is that I can also put LaTeX in the markdown. I'll show you this in a second. All right, any questions about Julia, Jupiter? Mm, markdown. I mean, there's a lot of kind of things that are very technical here. You haven't done a bit of linear algebra just yet. Okay, so now we're gonna get to this first cell and I'll actually just, I'll, I'll reproduce it first, okay? So what I'm gonna put is I'm gonna, call, I'm gonna make a variable, I'll call it V1 and I'll put, this is how you do an array in Julia, okay, an array. Yeah, that's how you'd expect in other languages as well. And I'll put a one in it, okay? So this V of one, you see it's a one element array Julia has type, so it kind of knows it's an array of integers, but we don't need to worry about this so much in the course. Most of this course deals with floating point numbers. So even if it's an integer, it'll be converted to a floating point if we'd like. Like if we would have put a 1.0, it was a, an array of a float, okay? Now here, computers are slightly different than mathematics because in mathematics, you know, you could have done something like this. You could have done V1 equals one or 1.0 1 if you'd like. And it would mean the same thing. And if I would ask you what the type of V1, type of V1, it's a float, it's a scalar, it's a single number. A float is a double, uh, well, it's a, it's a representation of a real number inside the computer. Okay. Uh, but this is an array, so it's an array with a scalar. But still mathematically, we think of this as a scalar, okay? A one-dimensional vector. Uh, of course, we can put V2, that would be the vector one comma two in this case, and that you could think of it as a vector in the plane, or V3 is a vector in space, or V4 is a vector in a higher dimensional, four-dimensional space, okay? By the way, in, in Jupyter, if I, if I if I'm in command mode and I hit L, I toggle line numbers. 
the L toggles line numbers. That's kind of useful to speak about things when we speak about the code. Um, so let me comment these two things out. Comments in Julia are like in Python. Okay, I've commented these two things out. Well, and what we see is typically we see, unless we put a semicolon at the end, which would suppress the output, what we, what we see is we see the last, um, the last expression in the cell is evaluated as the output, unless we had other commands that would print other output. Okay, so of course we have the length function. So let me look at the help for the length function. So the length function, this is a Julia length function, takes an array and tells us how many elements are in this array. I mean, it can also take a string as I showed in this example or something like that. But we'd use it for the length of an array, okay? So if I now show you this command, let, let me just now uncomment line five and run. So line five did a print len and said the length of V3 equals comma and then it actually evaluates the length of v3 and the v3 is a length is a vector of that of length three it has three coordinates sometimes you can call it the dimension of the vector but we'll use dimension for something else in the linear algebra as well okay now you might want to apply length to all of the vectors so what i can do here is in line number six look I, by the way i can untoggle comments i i do command on my mac or control on the pc and slash, and that toggles, untoggles comments. Okay, that's common in many editors. Okay, so I'm applying length, this dot is called broadcasting. I'm broadcasting length into the array of the arrays. Okay, and then it's, it's, it's giving me, well, the length of V1 is one, the length of V2 is two, three, and four, etc. Not a whole lot happening there, but you saw a whole lot, even though there's not a whole lot happening. Okay. Moving on, linear combinations of vectors. So here we have two vectors that are called V subscript one and V subscript two. And you need to be careful now. So, but by the way, in some notations, some people always put bars of, above the vectors or maybe sometimes under, maybe arrows, etc. But for us in this course, vectors are gonna be so common that we're not gonna annotate them with bars and arrows, okay? So you need to know if I wrote V subscript one, if I mean the first coordinate of the vector V, or do I mean the vector V1? Okay, you need to understand that from context, or I need to explain to you from context. So we both need to know what we're speaking about in context. Now look at this nice formula. How did I do it? Let me double click this. So this is now, you see the markdown cell. This is a markdown cell, it's not a code cell. This is written in the LaTeX language. A La, this is LaTeX. And LaTeX formula. So Google LaTeX and learn how to make, create basic formulas. Who here uh, has written a thing or two in LaTeX before? Some have, great. Um, and who has never even heard of LaTeX? Some of you have never heard of LaTeX as well. Okay. Great. And you know the answer. <coughs> so um when when researchers uh, in mathematics and computer science and statistics and in data science write research papers we format the whole document typically in latex we rarely wor work in word here you will use latex just for uh, creating basic formulas in jupyter if you'd like um, okay you don't have to but it it looks nicer and it's not hard to do so the notation is very simple, backslash alpha underscore one, that's alpha sub one, V underscore one, that's V one, etc. So you could also use these notebooks to kind of understand a bit of LaTeX notation. I'll try to share a nice LaTeX cheat sheet. Okay, so what we're doing here is we have the vector V one and we have the vector V two, and these two vectors are three dimensional vectors and we have the scalars alpha one, the scalar is alpha two. Now notice in Julia, what I can do, I can get actually Greek letters and that's convenient. I can do a backslash say eta, E-T-A, and then hit tab. And it'll, be, it'll convert to the Greek letter. So Julia writes all, gets all its characters. Uh, well, the language works on Unicode. So that's a 
much bigger thing than just an ASCII character set that just has a basic alphanumeric characters. Okay, so you can get variables like epsilon and things like that. Okay, so you do backslash, and you basically, this is how LaTeX works as well. So this, this is for Julia variables. This would work in the REPL as well. I won't, I won't show you now, just not to waste time, but, but you, you could use these, these characters also in the REPL. Okay, so this variable alpha one, when I created it, I did alpha tab, and I called it a one. Variable names, as you might expect, as many languages cannot start with a number, and they have to start with some other character. Okay, so what are we doing in line number five? We're doing exactly this. We're doing the linear combination of two vectors. So two vectors can get their linear combination. Um, what if this vector had another element? If the vector v2 had another element, um, would this work? Well, let's see. Dimension mismatch. So we can't add a vector of dimension three to a vector of dimension four. Okay. So we know how to uh, create linear combinations of vectors of a single dimension. Uh, have I defined here how to subtract vectors? So by doing these linear combinations, how do I subtract vectors? What would be alpha one and alpha two if I want to do V one minus V two? What would be alpha one and alpha two if I want to do V one minus V two? One and minus one, thank you. One and right, so you see if I do, if I get here a one for this guy, so it's basically not there and a minus one there. I can space this out a bit so it's a bit more readable. Okay, thank you. All right, a dot product. So a dot product is an operation that takes two vectors, okay, and creates a scale. Okay, there are many operations that can take two vectors and create a scale. A dot product is one, and it's kind of the one we, we use almost all the time. It's very useful, okay, because uh, we can do so many things with dot products. We can do, for example, a weighted average with dot product. We can do many other things with dot product. It's part of matrix multiplication, etc. So first of all, let's just, um, let me make this just a bit bigger. Let me see it a bit bigger. Um, so this is a notation for dot product u dot v. Now, when I do this, I think of u and v as vectors that have the same orientation, either both column or maybe less typically both row, but there are, both, there are two vectors. So this is, this is not a matrix operation. I'm saying don't write u transpose v and let u transpose dot v, don't do that. An alternative way to represent the dot product is like this, like this. Okay, and this actually thinks of u and v both as column vectors. It's important for the second representation that we think of them as column vectors, but we do the transpose of u. I'll get my notebook to work in the, after the break, and then we can do these types of things as well. Okay, so this is basically the matrix multiplication of the row vector, the one by n matrix and the column. And this is what the dot product means element-wise. Now here, u sub k and v sub k are the entries. I have a typo in this formula. What's a typo? With the indices. What's a typo? Should change something. K should be i, thank you. So k should be i or i should be k. Let's do k should be i. Oops, make it sign. So here you can see this is the LaTeX representation of sum you do sum underscore and you open these curly brackets i going one to n of u i v i shift enter and it looks like this nice formatted thing okay there's some questions uh, from lilith in julia is there lists and arrays like python or only arrays uh, there are arrays or dictionaries there are no lists okay there are sets okay python doesn't have arrays numpy has arrays okay but yeah Okay, um, and index zero. Oh, um, so Jonathan said index zero. So Julia indexing, and that's that you're gonna see now in this next uh, code snippet, Julia indexing goes one, two, and like MATLAB, not like Python and not, not like JavaScript, okay? So indexing starts one, two, and often when we, in, in linear algebra, we always speak about the indices of the vector one, two, and. 
Okay. All right. So let's look at this code snippet. Um, so I'll run it. And what we got here is an output. Oh, by the way, and uh, you asked in Julia, in Julia, there's also tuples. Okay, so a tuple is, is this thing with round brackets. Sorry, I'm, I'm jumping obviously between Julia and linear algebra, but the linear algebra here is introductory for me. So this thing, one comma negative three is a tuple. Okay, this thing, one comma three in square brackets is an array. Okay, this, the output here was actually a tuple that has a tuple. <clears throat> it's a tuple that has the first entry is a tuple and the second entry is an array. So tuples are like arrays, just like Python has tuples as well, but tuples are, are immutable. So you can't change the value, so you sometimes use it. So whenever I put two things with a comma that kind of creates a tuple and that's what happened in the output. Okay, <clears throat> let's look at line number two. It got the length of the vector v1, which I think was defined above. Line number three is kind of a weird line. It says n is check n equals equals is n also the length of v2. Now this is an or operator. And sometimes you do this type of lines in Julia. This is called kind of lazy evaluation, where if this thing did not happen, then this will be evaluated. And this at is a macro. Uh, it's like a shorthand for a function, really. Okay, and it will, it will print vectors must be of same length. So if I would put above, let's put v1 is one, two, three, and v2 is negative four, negative five. Uh, I've evaluated the cell above. Now I'm evaluating this cell. That error was my error, which I, I ran here. Okay, but if V2 is gonna be negative four, negative five is zero, etc. So let's make this a bit more uh, concrete. Let's use inner product here. So look at the coarse gray, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15 and, and 25, okay. So you can use inner product to compute, um, how many did we have? How many assessment items? Was it uh, one, two, three, four, five, and the sixth one. So, I'll do V1 is um, one six zero point fifteen times that. Okay, so and then I'll I'll also change V1 the six entry. Let's make it zero point twenty five. Okay, and V2. Let's say these are the grades that somebody gets on your assessment. So you get a ninety and an eighty really did that on the third one, a 30, and a 60, and a 90. Then you excelled and you got 100, okay? So if we do now the inner product of V1, V2, it's nothing but the weighted average. And you got 77.5. That's by the way, that's called a six, it's not a seven, okay? Uh, so that 30 really threw you off, I guess. All right, so that's how you can use an inner product. Now, here we're actually evaluating the inner product in multiple ways, okay? So the first one is we're doing V1 dash times V2, and that's exactly this, the transpose, okay? So V1 dash, this, this dash, sometimes people write it mathematically as well, is transposing this, this V1, okay? Here we're actually using the dot function. Here, we're also using the dot function, but we're being fancy. So what you can do is you can do C dot, which is actually a LaTeX shorthand for this dot in the middle, and V1, V2. That's what we're doing in this fourth guy. And in this fourth guy, we're doing something else. So this thing, this construct, which I'll copy up, is called a comprehension. Comprehension, I hope I spelled it correctly. And it evaluates this for K running in the range one to N. So if I do this, this is kind of the V1 times V2, this is kind of the weighted grade. Um, you know, here is what you see here, you got 13.5 out of 15 for the first one. You got 12 out of 15 for the second one. And the last one was 25, you got 25 out of 25. But then I'm applying the sum uh, on it and sum sums it up 
and that will be your inner product. So there we go, inner products. Questions? All right, so now what we do is we take a 10 minute break. Uh, I, and in the kind of the second five minutes, I'll ask to answer some questions, okay? Uh, if needed, but also answer, ask questions during class. So it's a 10 minute break. This is especially important for those at, uh, at home if you're watching this after the fact. So we'll start in 10 minutes. It's actually not 10 minutes, eight minutes, because we'll start at six. Okay, I stole it, so in eight minutes. Break has begun. All right, the break continues. Please don't stop breaking, but um, 
answer some questions in the break. So um, there was a question, the result of V1 times V2 is a float or an array? Um, so yeah, okay, and then you corrected V1 transpose times V2 transpose. It's a, uh, it's a float. It's a float, I believe. Um, so let's see, V1 transpose times V2. Uh, so I can do the type of, but it's a float. So um, it knew to make it a float. Now, you're, you had a typo in your question, but it wasn't bad. You said, what about V1 times V2? Can we just multiply two vectors? No, there's no operation for multiplying two vectors. Um, you get all this, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know all these errors. Uh, but you can do a dot times. And that would be a, um, an element-wise multiplication of V1 and, and V2. Okay, so funny enough that a different way to implement the inner product is to do the sum of V1 dot times V2. Okay, so that's also in MATLAB, this dot times or dot plus. Um, now there's a question, can we get this Julia script? For sure, so it's uh, the slightly older version is already in this GitHub page. Uh, and the newer dirty version after this class is gonna be there again, so I'll just push it. So in a sense, you can also see both of them. So you can see the one before and the one after because in GitHub, you could look at the history. Um, what's between the length and length of that? Oh, great question. I, I love these questions. It's fun. Uh, okay, so the length of, if I do this, If I do length of, well, before I do length, let's just see what this is. Type of this guy. This is an array of arrays, okay? It's an array of arrays. It's a one dimensional array of arrays. How many arrays are in this array? Well, there's four, right? So the length of that would be four. That just says how many, how many vectors we have in this list. Okay? Um, whereas if we do, length broadcasted to this v1, v2, v3, v4, then we're mapping length to v1, v2, v3, v4. Okay. And I think we will continue. This was kind of the intermission questions. Any more questions about the course? Um, and there's a question about Jupyter Notebooks. I don't know how to change Python 3 to Julia kernel. So the... the yeah, do is my GMS ring. Yeah, just at the right corner of the Jupyter Notebook, uh, it says uh, mine is Python 3, where yours is Julia 1.4, but I already installed the Julia 1.5, so I don't know how to do it. Okay, so if you have iJulia installed, you'll go to change kernel and you can change the kernel. But you should have followed the instructions as well for adding the iJulia package. Okay, so if you did not do, so you should have done in the repo, you should have done, uh, at some point with the second video, you, you would have done using pkg, pkg.add iJulia, like that. Okay, thank you. Okay, and that would install install iJulia. iJulia should find the default Python implementation and then embed a Julia kernel in there. So iJulia is a Julia package that connects to. You you might have a bit of trouble depending on what type of environment you have running but eventually it'll work. All right, um, more questions before we start? Um, no, okay, good. All right, uh, how to access Jupyter by Julia? So what you can do is you can do notebook, and you after, sorry, if you do using iJulia, I have iJulia installed, and then notebook. And that would launch it. I don't want to launch it because I already have a Jupyter notebook. Okay. Now, 
Again, it depends on your installation. Okay. All right, norms. So a norm is a number, and it's a number that uh, signifies the size of the vector. A vector uh, by itself does not have size. A vector is a multidimensional thing, but the norm signifies its size. And this basic norm that we're speaking about here is the square root of the inner product of the vector with itself, okay? So the inner product with the vector in itself, I mean, I could have written this, I could have added here, that's also the square root of the sum of i going one to n of ui squared, okay? Like that, I believe. Okay. So that's the norm, All right? Uh, this norm is called the L2 norm. Okay, so this is the this is the L two norm. The L two. Uh, there are other norms as well. There's also the L one norm, for example. The L one norm. And you sometimes put a subscript one just so we know it's L L L. It's the L one norm. So I'm just writing this directly in LaTeX. This is also so you just see a bit of LaTeX just for that, is a sum i one to n of the absolute value of u. Okay. Uh, so sometimes if we want to differentiate between the L2 norm, the L1 norm, then we put a subscript two here with the L2 norm. And there are other norms as well. Um, I've all, to be able to use a norm function, I should have, ran before as I did in this session using linear algebra. I can auto complete commands in Julia by hitting tab, as you might expect. So this is a norm of V1. And oh, let's see, this is the norm, our V1 is now a different vector. It's this, this vector V1, okay? This is your vector V1. The norm of V1 happens to be this number. A different way is norm of v1 comma 2. So this 2 says make it the L2 norm, but that was a default argument. Okay. And what, what's, by the way, what's going to be the, what's going to be the L1 norm of this v1? Remember what context this v1 came from. This v1 was your, uh, was these guys. What's the L1 norm of this, of these? One, because it's 100%, right? So I can do uh, norm v11 and v1. Or I can do the square root of v1 of the inner product of v1 times v1, that's it. Okay? Now, the norm of minus v1 is the same. Okay? Norm minus v1, because I'm squaring here, because I've done minus of n every entry, I'm squaring that minus doesn't play a role. So V1 can point in this direction or it can point in the opposite direction. The norm is basically its length, okay? This is L1 norm, I guess we spoke about. Okay, so some nice properties of norm. Mm, for this one here, this first one, let me actually just go, this is the first time I'll do it with you. Let's go to the, uh, to the writing pad. We do have a writing pad. Let's see if this thing works. So the norm of uh, a sum of two vectors, okay? The norm of a sum of two vectors. Now, sometimes you'll often do the norm, and by norm, again, all the time we're speaking, we're assuming there's like a little, I'll write it in yellow here, there's like a default two. You see this two here? It's like the two norm, but we don't care. It's there. Um, now, often we'll care about the, the norm squared. Okay, so the norm squared, remember that the norm squared of the vector u, so, oops, what am I doing? The norm of u squared is nothing but the inner product of u with itself, okay? It's the sum of the square of the entries, okay? That's before I did the square root. Right. So if I do the norm squared, then I have u plus v uh, transposed times u plus v. Okay. 
And now, even though we didn't speak about them, you've spoken about them before, Mass 7501 or elsewhere, in your makeup studies, etc. What you have here are basically matrix operations, and you can now start and do some distributions and, and, uh, and things like that. So first of all, we have a U transpose plus V transpose because the transpose of a sum is a sum of the transpose. Okay, so that's, that was this step. And then you can say that you will take, say, uh, this matrix, this I'll call the matrix, even though it's just a row vector and multiply it by that and multiply it also by that. So I will do, and with matrix multiplication, we have to remember, even though these are vectors, this is like matrix multiplication, we have to think about um, who's on the left and who's on the right. So U transpose U plus U transpose V. And then I can do this guy and maybe this guy. Okay, so I'll add those guys plus V transpose U plus V transpose V. Now, what I have here is U norm squared. That's this guy. That's this. Okay, that's that. Plus V norm squared. Now let's look at these two entries. Are they the same? U transpose V and V transpose U. And the same, I somehow have lost your chat because I'm sharing the other screen. I will never know how to use them. Okay, so uh, I get a no that they're not the same because they don't look the same. Uh, e transpose V group. And not commutative. Okay, okay. Okay, but what is the, what, what is this? Is this a vector, a matrix, a scalar? What is this thing? Vector, matrix, a scalar, this thing I've put in a square. What is it, a vector, a matrix, or a scalar? You transpose V. It's the inner product of U and V. It's a scalar, right? So that must equal U transpose V transposed. I mean, a scalar must be itself transposed. Now on the side, you also remember, even though we're all going to have it even a bit later today, that A, B transposed for matrices, for scalars or whatever, is B transposed, A transposed. So then I can apply, right? So if I do it, if I do this transpose here, I flip them, okay? And that just works from the way of transposition. This is a matrix product of A, B transposed, is B transposed and A transposed. Okay, we had this in the first semester and we review it and it's in the books and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so then that, that equals V transposed, U transpose, transposed. What's U transpose, transposed? U transpose, transposed. Transpose, transposed. Transpose, transpose. It's U, okay? Transpose like undid itself, all right? So that just equals V transposed U. So these guys are actually the same, okay? And hence, for these two guys, I can get a plus two U transpose V, okay? Or V transpose V, doesn't matter, okay? So this is this, when you're adding two, um, when you're adding, when you're looking at the norm squared of two, um, of the sum of two vectors, what you get is the norm squared of the first vector, plus the norm square of the second vector, okay? But also with this cross term. Now, if U and V were pointing 90 degrees to each other, and we'll speak about a whole lot of it in the course, if they were orthogonal, then this guy is zero, but otherwise it's not, okay? Questions about this? Let's go back to the Okay, this kind of seems to work. There's a future for online education. Can you see uh, my desktop screen again? The Julia? Yes, thanks. All right, so you've become extremely conservative with like yes or no, it's like Y or N. At the end, you'll kind of, you don't even want to send so many pixels, you just put a dot, like dot and a comma. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to waste too much chat. Okay. So this was this property of, of norms. Now the, these three prop, these properties here are uh, the fact that a norm is non-negative uh, is yeah non-negative is obvious because you're summing squares, 
okay squares are positive okay and we don't want to take a square root of this if this wasn't positive i mean we can we'd get an imaginary number but that's not for us for today now here you take gamma which is a scalar times the vector u okay so you take the vector u and you stretch it by gamma gamma is maybe greater than one and it kind of goes farther maybe gamma is between zero and one and it kind of shrinks maybe gamma is negative and it points another direction and shrinks and what that's going to do is you're going to get the same norm but gamma will come out now for, you know this is how you do this and uh, what you've used here is a fact that the square root of the square is absolute value okay so stick here a gamma Stick here a gamma, the square root of the square is the absolute value. Oh, Jonathan Ross gave it up. Thank you. Very good, Jonathan. I don't know what that means. You need to send me kind of a menu. Um, now, we've got here uh, also the other property that, um, of course, if, if the vector u is zero, if the, the vector u is zero, stick here zeros, your norm would be zero. But you also have that if the norm is zero that can only happen when the vector is zero if the vector is not if the norm is zero it tells you that the vector is zero so here this is this looks subtle this guy here let me zoom in so you see it i think you see it zoomed in okay but there's actually these zeros mean different things one of them is a scalar and one of them is a vector which one is a scalar which one of these two zeros is a scalar the one on the right or the one on the left which one of these two zeros is a scalar the left is a, is a scalar and the right is a vector. I mean, maybe u happens to be a scalar too, but then it's kind of boring. Okay, so we, we use zeros in different ways, and, and, but the, these mean different things. Okay, questions? All right, normalizing a vector. <coughs> Often what we do, both with data and elsewhere, is we take a vector and we normalize it so we're basically dividing by this norm so now here in julia what i did in this line seven i've actually defined this is how you define a function this is a one line function in julia it's a function norm vect the function norm vect gets an input argument v uh, that's a mistake it should be v divided by norm v. Okay. norm vect norm vect gets an in input argument v and divides by the norm okay this is scalar division so let's say i have the vector v1 here v1 is a bad example in the sense it's kind of these weights okay but that's okay so and vn is going to be the normalized vector of v1 so if i look at the norm of vn you see this this is basically a one it's numerically a one okay so that's the normed vector okay uh, so by norming a vector, we don't no longer know its norm, but we still keep its direction. So it's basically a vector that's somewhere on the unit circle or the unit sphere. In this case, it's a six-dimensional unit sphere. Okay, that's a, that's the action of norming. All right, we sometimes speak about the angle between two vectors, uh, and this makes a lot of sense when we think of vectors geometrically, as many of you have. And what we do is you can, you can actually do some computations, et cetera. And you, you can see that it's, if you, well, I mean, with, with two dimensional or three dimensional vectors, this will make geometric sense, but it's true for any dimension vector. Um, the angle is kind of a different measure of the inner product of u and v. But this is, this is here, what you have here is, what I've highlighted here in blue, is the inner product of u normed and v normed, okay? So this is the inner product of the two normed vectors, okay? Um, and then if I do the arc cosine of that, I'm actually getting the angle between the two vectors. But let, let's just see how this thing works. So what I'm gonna do is I'll take here the vector, first of all, let's take the vector 10, 0 and 10, 0. And I'm calling theta, the way I created this theta is like that, theta tab. You could have just called it theta if you'd like, but that's nice. Theta tab. Okay. A cos, A cos is the R cosine. 
Now, for those of you that haven't somehow haven't done mathematics for a whole bunch of time, don't freak out. You don't need to review all of trigonometry. Okay, I mean, you, you use the right trigonometry when you need for specific things. Okay, so we have the inner product of u and v divided by the norm of u and divided by the norm of v. So here, division goes left to right. So this basically evaluates this expression. I could have divided by the product of norm u and norm v. That's theta. And radians to degrees, well, arc uh, cosine gives me an angle in radians. So zero radians, pi over two, pi radians, etc. There's two pi radians in the circle. Radian to degrees tells me this angle in degrees. What's going to be this angle? Well, the angle is going to be zero. Okay, let's go to 10, 10, and 0, 5, 5. What's going to be the angle in degrees? What's this? I haven't evaluated this. What's this going to evaluate to? 90, 45, 45. There seems to be a mode around 45. Okay. I'm with you. Okay. And if I do a, if I do a 0 minus 10, then you get um, 90 degrees in the other direction, et cetera, et cetera. If I do a minus 10, 0, you know, 180 degrees. OK, so that's the angle. Um, you, you might see the function in Julia. If you do question mark, one question mark angle, You'll get you'll get this thing. Um, it's related. Why is that not working? Uh, huh. I think this is a, a this is there is some trouble with Julia when it does this uh, question mark angle. So somehow when you use the, the help function, sometimes it doesn't like it with comments above. That's some bug with Julia Jupiter. Uh, question mark angle. So the angle function in Julia gets a complex number. Im, im, if you do look, let's do a square root of negative one. Well, that didn't work well, did it? Um, but uh, square root of, ne <laughs> okay, square root of negative one plus zero im. That should work better. Yeah. Uh, okay, sorry, but m is the square root of negative one, uh, is an imaginary uh, number. Somehow, when I guess, oh, maybe square root of negative one point oh will work. No, it's still, square root doesn't like to give me the imaginary number. But you can do complex numbers in Julia. So you can, do, you can have the, the variable x, which is two plus three m, that's the complex number with the real part two and the imaginary part three. Okay, so the angle of a complex number, you can think of a complex number as a vector in two dimensional space and the angle would still give you that angle of that vector, but this angle function doesn't generalize to higher order vectors. Okay, it's a bit of a digression. Uh, now cosine theta, look, if I have uh, the angle between the two guys as r cos, if I apply um, cos on both sides of this equation, cos is the inverse function of arc cosine and vice versa. So I get the cosine of the angle is the inner product between the two norm vectors. Okay, there's not a whole lot of news. So you can find what I suggest is, is reading here in the VMLS book, go to the VMLS book and read chapter three, angle between vectors, and it can tell you a bit more. Okay. Um, all right, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is an inequality that speaks about how the uh, inner product of two vectors is related to their norms, okay? And this is it, this is it. Let's first of all read this. There's kind of a lot of characters, a lot of lines, a lot of notation here. Let's read this Cauchy-Schwarz. So what we see here is we have here the absolute value of the inner product of u transposed in v is less than the product of the norms. Okay, that's Cauchy-Schwarz. 
Now, you might see the inequality in a different form. Let me write the different form. I'll, I'll write it just like that. And that would be uh, what you'd have is u transposed v squared. This is how I do in LaTeX less than or equal, the norm of u squared. And sometimes I put in LaTeX like a tilde, it's kind of just a bit of a space, the norm of v. Okay, this is the same Cauchy Schwartz. Okay, if I do the square root of the second one, I get the first one. Okay, uh, squaring and square root. So squaring the norms, squaring the norm, or square rooting the norm squared does not. We don't need to worry about the sign because the norm is a non-negative entry anyway. Okay, and here we've, if we've done a square root of this, we've converted that to absolute value. Okay, so let's see the proof essence of uh, Kushi Schwartz, and you might have it as a as a homework assignment to do. Um, uh, you know what? Actually, let's let's actually do the the whole thing. So I'll actually I'll actually prove all of Kushi Schwartz because I th I think given the previous exercise I did on the. I did with, with writing, I, I think it might be useful for you. So let's work on proving Cauchy Schwartz. Okay, so that was this done, finished. And now we want to prove u transpose v absolute value less than the absolute value of u times the absolute value of v. This dot is not a dot product, okay? It's just the times of two numbers. So I even remove it. Okay, that's Cauchy Schwarz. So the, the proof is first of all, assume u not equal to zero and v not equal to zero. How can I assume? I asked you to prove it. Why do you suddenly assume? Well, all I'm, I'm doing, I'm proving it for the case u not equal to zero, v not equal to zero, because what happens with this, uh, now I can't see the chat, what happens with this, inequ with this um, inequality if u and v are both zero? What, what's, let's say u and v are both zero. Then it's zero equals zero, and that's okay. We're allowed zero equals zero, right? So the interesting case is when the vectors are not zero. This is zero vectors, okay? So let's assume that. Now, the key here, this is actually not one of these obvious proofs that just follow through. I mean, these guys thought about it about 200 years ago, maybe 150. I mean, it was proved by like four people, but Cushy Schwartz really got their name. Okay, so um, let's set alpha to be the norm of u, just to make notation simple, and beta to be the norm of u. Okay, and let's now look at a norm of a different vector. We'll look at the norm of a different vector, and that vector is going to be alpha times u um, minus beta times v. Okay, that's the vector we're going to look at. But I think I, I uh, made a mistake. Let's make uh, beta times u and alpha times u. It's a norm. Can this norm be negative? Can this thing be negative? Can norms be negative? I mean, this is a vector. This vector, this is a linear combination. This vector is a linear combination of two vectors. And the weights of these linear combinations happen to be the norms of the other vectors. But can this thing be negative? Can a norm be negative? Norms cannot be negative. No. So thank you. So this thing is not negative. And neither is its square. OK? The square is not negative. OK? So now we can go and we can do kind of the standard thing of of opening this guy. We've already opened norm squared. I'll do it here again briefly. Okay. Beta u minus alpha v transpose without the transpose, whoops. Like that. Okay. 
but I don't even have to kind of go through this step because I remember that when I take two vectors and I write the square, I get this thing. Well, sorry, I get this thing. Okay. Now, if here I had a minus, if here I had a minus, let's say I didn't have a plus, I had a minus, then what's the norm of, of minus V? What's the norm of minus V? Squared, if you'd like. It's like the norm of V, right? Minus V, V, same norm. So that's just the same. It's just that here I would have a minus. Okay. So what I'm saying is this is my one vector and this is my other vector. Okay. And I'm going to have here the norm of beta U squared with something in the middle. We'll get to that in a second. Plus the norm of alpha V squared minus two beta V, let me write this precisely, sorry. Beta U transposed times alpha V. Okay, that's what I've got. Okay, now, here I can do some, some things. So remember a scalar just comes out of the norm, but here it's a norm squared. So the scalar comes as, and is B squared. So that's B squared norm of U. This U here looks like a mu. Mu is a different letter, it's not mu. So let me write it nicer. Mu. Okay. And here I can also write alpha squared norm of V. Squared, squared, sorry. Now what happens here? Which ones are scalar in this expression? What are the two scalars? There's a, there's, there's this expression has a few characters. It transposes one of them. And it has a U and a V. They're vectors. But the scalars are in there. Scalars are the beta and the alpha. So the beta and the alpha also come out. Okay, minus 2 beta alpha U transpose B. Okay, U transpose B. Okay, now let's go back to the definition. What was B? Hmm, now I messed up. Uh, beta, beta U, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I think, I think I should have had here beta going, beta going here and alpha going there, like, like I had before. Okay, or, or maybe no. Uh, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. Didn't make a mistake, no mistake. No mistake, sorry. Okay, so what's beta? Uh, beta is V squared, so I'll write V squared, that's beta squared, U squared, minus two V squared, I'm not saying norm, norm V squared, norm U squared, times the inner product U transpose V, that's this guy, yeah, uh, plus alpha, is um, norm of u squared, and then one more, norm of v squared. Kind of fell off the page a bit. Okay. So what I can do now is I can uh, divide by um, one of the u and the, uh, this is a mistake. This is a mistake, I make too many mistakes, sorry. No square here, no square here, no square here, no square here. See, this is beta, this is alpha, it's not a square. Beta and alpha are, are normal V, normal V, okay? So I can now divide by the normal V and the normal V, right? There's a normal V and the normal V. So I'll, I'll divide that out, divide that out, divide that out, divide that out and I'm dividing here by zero. It was important that we assume that U and V are not zero because otherwise we'll be dividing by zero. Not allowed, not allowed in this course, no dividing by zero, yeah? Okay. So if we divide this, we have still zero is less than or equal and we're dividing by a qu positive quantity, that's important, so it doesn't change the uh, inequality, okay? If you were to divide by a negative, will change. If you want to know if it's negative or positive, you won't know if, how you can divide. Okay, so then you've got a norm of V, a norm of U, like that. One more. 
okay? Uh, minus two u transpose v plus normal u, normal v, we divide it. Now look, this term is like this term. Let's pop it to the other side and let's, uh, or you know what, let's pop this guy to the other side and then we have twice of this and divide by two. So what we get is u transpose v is less than or equal than norm of uh, u times norm of v. Now this almost, I'll put like a dotted line, this almost looks like cauchy schwarz This is almost this guy. What's missing? What's missing in cauchy schwarz The absolute, All right, this guy, the absolute value. Okay, so we've got kind of half of cauchy schwarz So we've shown that this is less than that. Okay, and uh, now if we repeat with um, minus u and v, okay, so repeat the whole thing, then you're going to get, let me go here now, black, back for black, u v is a minus is less than u transpose v. And then this guy, these two guys together give you push schwarz. Okay. These two guys together give you push schwarz. That's a proof. Give you, I won't go up, give you this guy. And that's a proof. So you'll find this uh, proof in the VMLS book, okay? So look, out, you look also, C, V, M, oh, oh, oh. V, M, L, S, page uh, 57, roughly. Okay. The proof is not so important. I mean, it's, it's more an exercise of working with them. Um, With, with vectors in this case, in inner product. Okay, questions? Okay, I assume you can see the, um, uh, you can see now this again. Okay. All right, another result. Which is often kind of uh, thanks, Jonathan. So it's 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 often um, taken before cauchy schwartz but we're actually going to use cauchy schwartz to prove it, and that's called the triangle inequality. Triangle inequality. Now, triangle inequality. You know, triangle inequality for absolute values. Okay, so the absolute value of x plus y is less than the sum of the absolute values of x and y, but it's also true for the norm. Now. It's not even also true. So some people, not some people, mathematicians define actually a norm based on and a norm is any function from a vector to scalars that satisfies these properties, non-negative. And when you scale by scalar, you get the scalar out and the norm of zero, if the norm is zero, it means that you have the zero vector. And most importantly, the triangle inequality. Okay, so also see the VMLS book for the triangle inequality, um, but let's just see very quickly how we can prove the triangle inequality using Cauchy-Schwarz. So you see you've got u plus v squared here, so you've got this norm of u squared plus two twice inner product plus the norm of v, and then this thing that I'm highlighting now by Cauchy-Schwarz is less than I mean, if the absolute value is less than the product of the norms, then the, this is certainly less than the product of the norms, twice the norms. And then here, you're using the age old um, equality in algebra. Okay, to put these back there, to, to go from this back to that. Now, you've got the norm squared is less than the sum of the norm squared, now take square roots, and you've, got, and you've got an inequality here, and that's a triangle inequality. Okay? 
All right. So now let's prove things in a non-proofy manner, just to, to, to play around, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna look at this little snippet, which um, is gonna, it's gonna take vectors of, of length 10. And it's gonna run on so many vectors. And it's gonna initialize an empty array. And this is a for loop. This is a for loop. Who here has done a for loop before? Just to see that you can still press a thing on the keyboard. Who has done a for loop before? Yes, 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 yes. You're like in a for loop of yes. Who has not done a for loop? Which is fine, you can proudly say. You don't do a for loops, only go to's. Come on, somebody has not done a for loop. You've all done a for loop. Okay, so here's another for loop. Fine. So we got the for loop out of the way. Uh, I mean, from time to time we get a we get a student that, that has not programmed in any language, um, and that's that's fine. But then you, you might want to just you'll have a bit more of a learning curve uh, as you can figure out programming is kind of a, or at least basic programming is kind of an integral part of data science. Uh, but you'll pick it up. Um, all right, so this for loop, I could have put the variable i. So i runs in the range one to n, but I'm not gonna use i, so I'll just put an underbar, so I'm not using i. And then in line five, I'm getting a rand vector of length, see here's a vector of length 20, random vector. What's random? Well, it's not really random, it's pseudo random. Whenever you use random in a computer, uh, unless you have one of those true physical random number generators, you're using, you're getting a pseudo random uh, number and we can even set their seed to kind of make them repeatable. We'll probably do more about that. So that's RAM 20. Okay, so here you've got U and V are both of length 10. And what we're doing here in line seven is the kind of the Cushy twice. So what I'm, I'm taking Cauchy-Schwarz and Cauchy-Schwarz tells me that this is inequality of Cauchy-Schwarz, okay? So I could have written Cauchy-Schwarz as, let me just copy this and go up here. Let's check. And I could have written this as, um, being greater than zero. Oh, why is it not working? So look, I've tried to set the cell and, and what's happening with the cell? The cell is now a code cell. So I'm gonna hit escape and the letter M, which is like going to the cell menu and doing cell type markdown and now it's a markdown cell. Okay, so I'm evaluating the right hand side, normal view times normal V minus the absolute value of the inner product and that's CS. And then line eight is, you know, append, the array. Now exclamation marks in Julia, this bothers a lot of people. Exclamation mark in this case is part of the function name. So you can look at the function push, exclamation mark, and push is part of its name. You know, it's, by the way, some people have this too. Some people have punctuation uh, in their name. I think it might be hard sometimes, but some people manage to push it through. So this exclamation mark is part of the push name. And the reason it's that is because when you give it an array, it actually modifies the array by reference. Okay, so it's, 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 it's changing the array. So that's a notation of the function that makes a change to its input argument you put an exclamation mark. So you give it array one, you push to its CS, and by this time array one grew by one. And then in line 10, we get the minimum all, all over the array. So I run this. And what do I expect to see? I see a number, fine. And let me run it now with a million entries. Okay, I got a number. What kind of number here as an output would make me feel that, oh, something's wrong with either the mathematics or my program? What would make me kind of unhappy if I'd get a number there? For example, negative uh, 0 0.1 or less than zero, right? So I have a belief that this thing is always positive. The mathematics just told me, I mean, the, 
that proof. There's something very good about a proof. You don't need a program, right? But here we can run it for 10 million entries. And Julia is fast, 10 million. And I mean, most of the time it's spending now on allocating the array, by the way. Okay, so what, it's actually keeping an array of 10 million. And every time you're doing push, you know, the array kind of needs to reallocate and reallocate a bit because it's kind of it's expanding. Uh, so this is still, the star is evaluating. This is still running. Okay, but it's not going to be next. Okay, so if I want it, if I want this, uh, you know, for triangle inequality exercise, uh, modify, tell me now, please modify line seven to check for triangle inequality. Give Julia code in chat. So I've got two vectors. I want to check the triangle inequality. Just give Julia a code there. It's it's elementary, but it's good to do. So what would I do in line seven for the triangle inequality? Triangle inequality. So triangle inequality is that the norm of the sum is less than the sum of the norms. So what do I want to be positive? Come on, somebody give me some code in Julia chat. Check if CS is less than zero. No, not exactly, but because triangle inequality doesn't deal with inner products. So with the triangle inequality, I'll, I'll, I'll as you work on it, I'll start to copy it here. Again, this, this program, it's kind of a silly program. It's, it's checking something that we know is mathematically true, but that's not a bad thing. And then we see that we can program okay, and we see that the mass is okay. So this is a triangle inequality, again, and it changes to a markdown cell, um, which is equivalent to, I'll move this to the other side. Yeah, I, I mean, I fully agree that CS is proved to be larger than zero, but, but that was for the cushy schwartz so, so for triangle inequality, how would I implement this? So I'd, I'd put like triangle inequality is the norm of U plus norm of V minus norm of U plus V. And I'm now going to push it TI. Okay, we don't need the CS anymore. Yep, exactly. So that was written by somebody very good, by Shishwan. Thank you. And let me now go 10 to the 7. Let's just go 10 to the 5. And okay, we didn't get a negative. We are happy. Okay. Now, by the way, you're, you're, uh, you're a data scientist, so you might as well do uh, uh, using plots. Um, and as we speak about other things. So now, Julia, okay, you should install a few packages. Uh, you, there are different ways to do this. One is you can install a whole bunch together, like, like, is it, like in the video that I shared. The difference is you can install them one by one. So if you don't have plots installed, you would need to do using package and then package.add plots. Okay, this would install plots, the plots JL package. Now, first time I'm using here plots, you see it's pre-compiling plots. Okay, so and these plots, it's actually a bit of a, a setback with Julia. It takes a while sometimes to do the first plot. Now it's going to take a whole lot, a whole lot, a whole lot because it's pre-compiling. Now, let me just, since we're speaking about packages, let me also take you to the, this is a Julia repo, and some of you might have gotten there. A different way to deal with packages in the repo, if you do right back, right square, I'll put it in the chat now. I'm putting this guy's uh, closing square arrow in the repo. Um, then it puts me in package mode. You see the thing change? If I do backspace, I'm in normal mode, package mode. Normal mode, package mode. 
And then I can do like, I'll do question mark. There's a whole bunch of package commands. So you can do add plots. That's instead of installing plots like this. Okay. Let's just see so you now. All right. Let's leave this junior kernel. Go back here. Plot is still warming up. In the meanwhile, let's speak about matrices. All right. I mean, I wanted to do a plot, a histogram of this array, which is kind of interesting. Histograms are kind of interesting, but let's speak about that later. Let's let this plots work. So here's matrices, and actually we're using here plots. I don't know why it needs to pre-compile again. Maybe there's an update to plots. I'm not sure. Um, okay. So when I do RAN 300 by 300, uh, what I get is a matrix of 300 by 300. It's a big matrix, ah, not a huge matrix, but it's a big matrix, okay? Nearly um, 90,000 entries. Uh, not nearly, there's 90,000 entries. Um, so, yeah. Now, a heat map of a matrix is a plot like this that plots a matrix like a picture, okay? Uh, and you want Y flip true for it to have the right orientation like we draw matrices. So we draw matrices from top left to bottom right. Okay, you'll see this with a smaller matrix. Um, my, my kernel is still running, so I'll let it be for a while. <laughs> now here, we're actually constructing a matrix manually. Okay, so what did I call this construct? When you have some expression, which I'm highlighting, for i and in this case j do you remember what i call this construct it's also called this way i think in a comprehension text and it's also called that in python and maybe in r as well okay so what i'm doing here is i'm letting i run from one to ten j running one from ten and each time i'm doing the boolean expression if i is j plus four or if i is j minus two i'll make it a one Otherwise, make it a zero. So it's creating this type of matrix. So you see it's this double band matrix. This has this band of ones. Because here, I is J, I is one, and J is three. So I is um, J minus two. So this is I equals J minus two, this band. And this band is I equals J plus four, this lower band. Okay, so sometimes you can construct matrices like this by specifying the individual element. This is, of course, a matrix of Boolean entries. And here I'm doing a heat map of this matrix, so you can actually see this is that band of ones. You see this is the heat map index, and all the blacks are zeros, and this is the other band of ones. I just put this matrix so you actually see how this white flip true flag works, because somehow if you don't put it, the matrix is upside down in, uh, in, in its plot. Okay, this thing finally finished, good. Uh, congratulations, really. Let's first run this, this, uh, this one just to see the heat map and then we'll play with that histogram I want. Now, even after a pre-compiled plot, which was like a once in a very long while event, still the first time to plot in a session is long. So apologies, uh, it's a known thing with the Julia language because it's kind of pre-compiling this plot, which is a big thing. Okay. I'll let this run and continue in a sec. I'll get back to in a sec. All right. Now this is how you input matrices, just like in MATLAB. Okay. This is a two by two matrix. And what's the dimension of the matrix C here? What's the dimension of the matrix C? This is a two by three. Thank you. It's a two by three. It's not a three by three. It's a two by three. So you got the first row in the second row, right? So you've got two rows. You could have written it like that, which is maybe more readable, okay? And this is a two by three matrix. Okay. Now, since I have three matrices, well, this thing is still running, right? Okay, now it finished. So after it ran first time, second time is gonna run quick, okay? Third time gonna run even quicker, because each time the compiler even compiles kind of with a bit more optimizations. So now let me go back here, we, uh, I'll, kind of the debt I had from before, just to, just to have some fun. So we've got this big R1, which was this, um, this, um, this is how, this is kind of the gap in, uh, in uh, the triangle inequality, right? Like when, when would TI, by the way, be exactly zero? 
when would Ti be exactly zero? And I'm going now back to the triangle in quotes. When would Ti be exactly zero? Okay, when, when, when u and v equals zero. Now, can it, can it be also in a, in a different uh, case? No? When you equal, when one is zero and the other is not zero? Um, no, then it's, then it's not gonna be zero because then it's not gonna be zero. But we want the norm of the sum to be the sum of the norms. Um, I don't know. Let's think about that. Just keep, keep it for you to think about. Um, so take, take this R1, let's now do a histogram of that. So and let's just see what we see. And I don't know what we'll see, but, but actually playing with histograms is sometimes important, right? So, so here we had this, uh, this is completely random vectors. Now they're random with a given distribution. They're kind of uniform distribution between zero and one. Okay, and when we look at this gap, we get this, this random entry ti, we actually get this very special distribution. Um, if you do some probability, you can actually analyze the analytic form of this distribution. Okay, so this is a probability distribution. Uh, sometimes when you do this, you might want to do legend because we don't care for this. We're only plotting a single entry. Did somebody want to say something? Okay, so there was when u equals um, negative v. Well, when u equals negative v is still not going to be zero because then uh, when u equals negative v, this is zero. Okay, but this is a norm of u, this is twice the norm of u. Okay. All right, let's move on. Um, so we've done this. Now, here, does somebody want to say something? Genuine doubt? No. Um, okay, so when the cosine of u and v are one. All right, so when the vectors are completely uh, perpendicular or, or, uh, or they're completely aligned. So let's see. Let's take u to be uh, five, five. Let's take v to be 10, 10. Okay. You got two, two vectors like that. And let's look at the norm of u. Fine is something. And let's add to that the norm of v. Some, that's the sum of the two norms. Let's look at the norm u plus v. It's the same. Well then, okay. So when the vectors are in the same direction, then taking one and taking the other is like taking both. So get, getting a step at the direction, at that 45 degree angle direction towards five, five, a step of length, uh, well, a step of length, it's not of length five, a step of side length five, okay? And then taking another step is the same way. So, but this, of course, this type of situation uh, only happened because we had random vectors. Only happened, you know, it never happened exactly precisely. If you look at if you look at the distribution, you know, for these guys here, they were almost completely aligned. But most ten-dimensional vectors that you will choose will not be completely aligned, right? I mean, what's the chance of two ten-dimensional vectors that you choose to be completely aligned? Of course, you can continue an experiment with this, for example. So let's not take 10-dimensional vectors, but let's just take two-dimensional vectors, okay? So I repeat the whole thing with two-dimensional vectors. Look what happened to the minimum now. It's almost zero. And let me plot the histogram with two-dimensional vectors. And now you have many more vectors. Not all of them are completely aligned, but many more that are completely aligned. 
Okay, so here kind of through statistical looking at the deviation of, of, of the, let's call it this, the gap in the triangle inequality, we kind of had a, had a bit of reason. All right, thanks. Let's get back, let's now go to get to matrices. So you've got these three matrices. Of course, I could have finished with like a matrix C, and this is how you see the matrix in, in Julia, okay? Julia matrix is an array, it's an array of this case of ints because I didn't have floating point numbers. And this two is a dimension of the array. Okay, it's not a one dimensional array, it's a two dimensional array because I index it both by I and by J. Oh my God, 657, I didn't take the break. I should have taken a break. You guys should have told me. <laughs> so let's take a three minute break. <laughs> I'm sorry. If nobody tells me about the break, we can't take the break. But uh, let's continue at seven, okay? Keep going. No, we need a break. I can keep going, but you need a break. Maybe I need a break. Break, break. So let's continue in three minutes. <laughs> no, religious about the breaks. Obviously not. By the way, if anybody wants to turn on their camera just so you, to see each other, I don't think this is recorded when you turn on your camera feel free. During the lectures, maybe not good for uh, bandwidth, but feel free to turn on if you want. And feel free not to, obviously. I'm gonna stretch. I'll answer the question in a second. All right, back seven. Uh, so what's the difference between flexible and external study? It's a good question. So flexible is, um, you go to the um, tutorials, to the practicals, no tutorials in this course, to the practicals on Thursday, face to face. Um, but if you can't, you can still do it externally. An external, uh, you don't go to the practicals, okay? I was kind of aiming that all the practicals will be um, um, online, just to um, give uh, Sam and Walla, the tutors, a bit more ability to control it well, because what they'll do is during the practicals, they'll be dealing with the people, with you guys that are there, the flexibles. You guys, by the way, you must be very flexible. Like, you know, flexible and external you're, you're obviously uh, external does that answer this is kind of a new invention it's it's like a covid invention um almost like this does anybody know can anybody name this thing 
this is still kind of the continuation of the break. It's kind of oozing out of the brain. Can anybody name this fruit? Passion fruit. That's quite impressive, Jonathan. Okay, yeah, okay, it's a passion fruit. I don't know, not related to the course. Uh, completely, this will not help you with linear algebra, this knowledge of fruit, but um, you know fruit. Okay, more questions? The thing is about online education is I, I have to kind of entertain myself and I never get feedback if it's funny, but that's fine. Don't feedback, just it's probably not funny. Any, any questions? How will we be practicing this material? Are you talking about the fruit? No. So the, you, you basically um, have your preparation for the, let's go ahead and listen. So, One form of practice is creating the two assignments, okay? The two assignments. Um, practicing for the quiz, and, and you'll get information here. So you, when you click quiz one, there's still not information here, but there's information how to practice for the quiz, okay? Uh, but basically these uh, six points of assessment are each kind of, of their own nature. So the, the quiz is, you know, you, it's, it's controlling. In this case, the quiz will be about uh, vectors and matrices and a bit about linear uh, systems of equations and just a bit more, okay? Um, and the assignment is in a sense preparation for the quiz. This is not a course with a final uh, exam. The project should be rather extensive, okay? And you'll get information about the project uh, mid through, midway through the semester. Um, the going through these Jupyter notebooks and actually reproducing things and, and, and playing with things is, is probably good practice as well. Uh, but of course, there's also an analytic component. Does that help? Um, the quiz format. So quizzes, let, I'll, I'll, let me show you quizzes from last year. Um, not, not from last year, from last semester. Uh, so those of you that did Math 7501, you know the quiz formats. Uh, if you click Math 7501 here, this is a Math 7501. Um, you can actually see this is like quiz one. And I've, and I've suggested looking at the quizzes for, uh, for review. Quiz one is not so important for review because it kind of goes into sets and logic beyond what you need for the course. But for example, Quiz two, for those of you that are making up Math 7501 material, quiz two is maybe good for review. Like working on these questions in the quiz with open format is maybe some form of review that you'd want to do. Again, it's, it's kind of far from, these quizzes are a bit far from the material we're doing, but they're background material you sort of need. So the format is kind of like these quizzes. I hope that helps. More questions? Um, yeah, I, I would. Um, so, you know, reading through the textbooks and so active reading, reading plus understanding plus writing, I think is, is the right way. Uh, you don't need to be in, in full fitness for an exam with this course. Uh, the quizzes are rather elementary, kind of just to see that you understand the basic notions and know how to do the basic things. Um, the project and some parts of the homework will be more involved. Okay. So yeah, I, I, there'll be there'll be some kind of suggestions on what to do. Sure. All right. More things. All right. Okay. So we're with matrix C. So we've got the matrix C here. Um, now, if I want to kind of see all three matrices, I'll use the display function. So display, I can just I, I put here the function with the semicolon because I put it on the same line. But display A, display B, display C. I see the three matrices. Good. So I've got the matrices. Now you can add two matrices. I can add A plus B. Can I add A plus C? Can I add A and C? No, I cannot, because they're not of the right dimension. Okay, so the matrices have to be in the right dimension. I can multiply a matrix by a scalar. Okay, just like I multiply a vector by a scalar. In Julia, I can even do like 3A 
you can put the literal three. You can do this with a variable, but you could put three A, that's like three times A. Okay. Uh, both for matrices and scalars. Um, I can do linear combinations of matrices um, of the same size. Okay, twice times the matrix A plus matrix B. Oh, and you see I can't add A plus C. Okay. The big thing is matrix multiplication. Okay, matrix multiplication. Uh, and I'll soon just switch to the, um, the iPad and, and just explore kind of four ways of multi matrix multiplication, but let's just look at it very quickly here. So A times B, the matrix A times B, let's look at the matrix A and B. This is display A, display B. Okay, so the first entry of A, A plus B is going to be, I'll just, I'll just take the first row of A. So I know it's very basic, but some of you have not, have not seen this for a while. So I do A11 times B. So, let, so let's, let's, say I'm, let's say I wanna get to, let's actually get to this 21, okay? Or no, to this nine, okay? So I get the first row. So let's see to, I'll write here as a comment. Okay, so uh, to get to the nine value in entry one, two of the product AB, uh, I take the inner product of the first row of A and second column of B. Okay, so it's A11, I'll just do it manually. I'll do A11 times B21 plus A12. This is, look, notice here I'm, I'm doing index to reference to the matrix, times B22. And that should give me 21, it didn't, why not? A11, uh, A12, oh, that should give me a nine. A11 and B21, why did it not give me a nine? A11, B, Two. Oh, B, yeah, B21, A12. Why in the world did this not give a nine? B12, B12, thank you. B12, B22. Thank you. Good, thanks, that was a mistake. Good catch. All right, so that's matrix multiplication, okay? Uh, but we'll speak about it more extensively in a second. Now, just I, I want you actually to see like a full, this is my, uh, and, and what, what do I, let's just look at this just before we continue. A times B gives me this, and B times A gives me something else, okay? Matrix multiplication is not, not what? Matrix multiplication is Generally, not, not what, not, A times B was not B times A, it's not commutative, thank you. Commutative. Why do I say generally? Because there are specific matrices that commute. I can find matrices that commute, but, but gen, are, if I take two arbitrary matrices and the order of the multiplication matters, okay? Uh, now, of course, for multiplication, I have to have the uh, number of rows in the first matrix has to match the number of columns in the second matrix. All of the matrix multiplication and more is, of course, in the Mass 7501 reader as well as the references. But of course, this whole course has matrix multiplication non-stop. So that's why I'm kind of a bit brushing school. We're just going to see a whole bunch. Um, so here I'm writing a function. Now, I've written before a function. Here is how I can write a function. You know, f of x equals x squared. That's like the function, a one-line function. See, f of negative 4, 16. That's like a one-line function. And here is how you can do kind of the formal bigger function. And this here is, what would you call this? Maybe a doc string. Okay, this is a doc string. This is like the documentation of the function. So I've called this function my mat mult, my matrix multiply. Okay. And it's, of course, we don't need to write a function for matrix multiplication, but it's good to do just for the exercise. Uh, 
Okay, so what do I do? I get the size of the matrix A. And I get the size of the matrix B. And here I check, check number of calls of A. This is maybe the wrong check. Uh, I don't think this is the right check. What I want to check is that, uh, no, yeah, number of calls of A equals the number of rows. Uh, sorry, number of, what am I doing? Uh, uh, number of calls of A equals number of rows of B. Okay. M not equal P, thank you. Okay, that's what we're doing. Okay, and if that's not the case, I'm gonna throw an error and the function is gonna crash. Okay, so let's just see. Before I do this, let's just try my mat mold on the matrix one, two, three, or sorry, I'll put it like this. One, two, three. This is a matrix, this one, two, three is a matrix. You see, there's no, no commas here. Just so you see this one, two, three. Is, is a matrix. This is a one by three matrix. Also happens to be a row vector. Okay. And let's multiply by the matrix one semicolon two. This one semicolon two is a two by one matrix. This is a two by one matrix. Also happens to be a call vector. Okay, so let's do matrix multiplication of these guys. And, but matrix multiplication should have yielded to me. Although I did the wrong check here. Oh, maybe I didn't run this. Um, so the number of rows, so the size of one, two, three. is one comma three. So that M is at three. And if I do the size of one semicolon two, that colon one, I get a, oh, oh, I see. Okay. Um, so this is a different type of mistake. So, so here, you know what? This matrix is not a, it's not a matrix, it's a vector. So that's my, that's a Julia thing. Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of confusing you. Um, this is an array, it gave us an array. To get a matrix from this, uh, okay, I'm not sure. Let me just, let me just make it a, a two by two matrix, okay? So I'll, I'll get back to you on that. So two negative three, okay. Okay, so now I'm, I'm doing a three by one attempt to multiply a three by one matrix by a two times two matrix. The mistake I had before was a different type of error. It was like Julia thinking this thing is not a matrix and it didn't know how to deal with size. Um, so for some reason I thought that, that creating such an object would give us a matrix, but no, it's actually a vector. So that's side thing. Um, so this is this is our size mismatch in in ninety nine nine. So I go to in ninety nine nine, and this is error. Of course, the matrix sizes don't agree. Okay, but if we are here, then they do agree. And C is going to be the resulting matrix, and it borrows the dimensions n times n and n and q, right? The number of rows of the left hand matrix and the number of columns of the right hand. And what we're doing here is we're gonna loop from I going on all the Ns, from J going on all the Qs, and we're gonna say that the IJ entry is the dot product of, now this is important, this is first time you're seeing this, but if you've done MATLAB before, then this is how it is in MATLAB. This is dot product of I row of A and J called of B. And 
That's one way of doing it. What's the complexity of this? So if A and B are like, say, N by N, just to make it clear, if they're two square matrices, what's the complexity? How many, how many operations does this function do if A and B are N by N, roughly? N squared, so this one says N squared, but Zhang Bai says uh, N cubed. Well, you've got n squared iterations in this loop, but this dot product involves another loop in its own right of running on the entries of the row and the column, right? So n cubed. So in general, matrix multiplication is kind of n cubed. There are actually algorithms that can do matrix multiplication in like n to the power 2.4 or something like that, but they're, uh, the constants are huge, so there. Still, this, even though this looks like matrix multiplication, just for the fun, and here, by the way, I'm doing question mark on my math mult, and you see it says my own matrix multiplication function. And you can even write here on the help things in LUT. Okay, so A times B. This is in LUT. And if I'll do a help. I thought I would put that in it, but no, maybe I didn't run this. Oh, okay, I need a backslash dollar. You need to do these backslash dollars if you're putting LaTeX in the doc string, um, just for, re for string processing reasons. This is not critical. Okay, now we get this A times B, even though it didn't work, you need another backslash backslash, it's enough. Okay, and now it will work. So I just want to get uh, LaTeX for me. This A times B was LaTeX in the help of my matrix. Maybe you'll do this in your project. Not, not critical. So just to have a look, um, let's take here, uh, let's do a little numerical experiment, okay? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take a random matrix, 100 by 100. And in line two before that, I'm just gonna set the seed. So let me explain what this line does. So Setting the seed of a pseudo-random sequence implies that every time that I run this cell, the same pseudo-random numbers uh, will appear. And they're all a function of this zero, even though it's kind of in a random one. Uh, so it's a common thing you do to, for kind of for re reproducibility, okay? So I'm starting here with the matrix A, and then look, I'm wrapping up this code in this time macro. Basically, it's going to time how long it's going to take the, the thing to run. So I'm going to do a thousand iterations. Uh, this global keyword is simply because A is like a global, not critical. And it's going to say A is what it was before times a new random matrix. Okay, so I'm going to multiply 100 by 100, 100 by 100, 100 by 100, 100 by 100, like that. Okay, run this thing. Let's run it. Let's see how fast this thing runs. Uh, it took like uh, two and a quarter seconds, okay? And this is how much memory it used. Now, let me run the same thing with my matrix multiply, okay? But I'm not even gonna run it a thousand times, I'm just gonna run it like a hundred times, okay? So I'm gonna run it 10 times less. So this is 10 times pure matrix multiplications, and it took about the same time. So if I'm gonna put a thousand times, it should take about 10 times more. It might be faster in the second run, maybe because it's compiling. Julia kind of optimizes the code every time when you compile it. The reason I want to put, and this thing is still running, right? The reason I want you to see this is that this multiplication, this took 15 seconds, this took 2.25. So this multiplication here done by uh, Julia, which is actually done by something I'll write it in the chat. It's called, well, I don't need it in the chat, so uh, I'll just put it up here, right? L, LA pack. So Julia uses um, Julia uses matrix routines, which are the same matrix routines used in MATLAB and used in some other languages as well, called LA pack, which are highly optimized for caching and for memory allocation. And even though this work did n cubed operations per multiplication, just like this did n cubed operations per multiplication. Um, my manual matrix multiplication was much, much slower. That's just a point to kind of keep in mind. Okay, hope I'm not boring you. Um, any questions?
Okay. So let's now just do the four ways of matrix multiplication and then we move on. Um, I thought we might get to an application today, but that, that won't happen. So today is kind of a bit dry, but it's not really dry because you're doing all these things with Julia and you, um, well, I'm convincing myself it's not dry. Maybe it's very dry. Maybe you're sitting at home completely bored saying, oh my God, did I really sign up for this degree? Yes, you did. Um, okay. I'm not bored. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Okay. All right. <laughs> Next. All right. Um, so we have these two matrices and I can write them like this. I'll write like A. Let me, let me, let me do like this. Let me put a, let me put what I call here. This is a fat matrix and this is a skinny matrix. Okay. B. So A is N by M and B is M by P. Okay. So the internal dimensions match and the product will of course be uh, C which is going to be kind of like this. In this case, it'll be uh, N by P. I mean, the, the N and the P kind of look similar. It doesn't have to be square. The product, N by P. Okay, so you've got the N and the P in the output. Okay, so what we did is a matrix multiplication. We implemented it by taking the I J, this was the I th entry, and this was the J th entry, where we ran on the I th row, on the jth column of B, okay? So what we said here, and if this, if we call this a matrix C, so we said the ISJS entry of C is some K going one to the internal joint dimension, this M, okay, of A, um, I, K, B, K, J. This is an inner product between the, this, these two vectors, okay, between this one, in this one. So that's, that's kind of, let's call this way one. That's way one of looking at matrix multiplication. Okay, but there's also way two. For way two, first of all, think about a matrix times a vector. Okay. Right. Matrix times a vector. So when we do a matrix times a vector, then each entry here is going to be the uh, inner product of this row and the vector, okay? And then you got this entry here is this row and the vector again, etc. up to the last row, which is the inner product of this row and the vector again, okay? So that's a matrix times a vector. Now, you, you, can, you can look at it this way, but you can also say that this entry here is like, now, let me now represent A in terms of columns. So I'll put here this, let's call this A, let's call this A, I'll, I'll abuse a bit. I'll call this A1 and I'll call this column A2 up to the column A, how many do we have say? A, M, okay? So this vector here is the column A1 times this entry X1. Let me put the X1 here on the left, okay? plus the X2 times the column A2 plus Xn, this is like Xn, the last one right here, okay? Times the column A, well, I should have say M, uh, Xn times AM. So what I'm saying is that when you do, when you multiply, when you, uh, sometimes you can call it, you can apply a matrix to a vector, you're doing a linear combination of the columns, okay? Linear combination of columns. This is gonna be critical when we speak about the multiplication by a matrix is actually a linear transformation, is actually a mapping, okay? It's a linear combination of the columns. Now, if you are multiplying now, not just A by a vector X, but you're multiplying A by, um, you know, by a, a um, this needs to be roughly of the same length, right? By a, um, you can think of this, let's call this now, let's call this B1, 
let's call this B2, up to B, how many of them are? BP. Okay, so the result, each row here, the, this is I, this is a jth row here, is going to be a linear combination of the jth, so let me, let me highlight it here. This is like the jth, this is BJ, okay, and this is the jth row. It's a linear combination of, of this and the columns of this column. So this column is going to do a linear combination of these columns and give you this column. Okay, so what I'm saying is the jth column of the resulting product is a linear combination of the columns of the left-hand matrix, where the weights of the linear combination are given by the entries of the jth column. That's way two, and the only way you can do it is you need to kind of experiment with it. You need to write this out. You need to convince yourself that this is true. So this is called linear combination of calls. Okay, let's go to way three. So way three is kind of the dual of way two, okay, of matrix multiplication. So when you speak about duals, you typically transposing. Whatever was a column was a row, whatever was on the right was on the left. That's kind of the word dual, dual, D-U-A-L, dual of way two. Okay, so for this, think of now that you have some vector x here, which is a row vector, and you multiply it by a matrix. And now think of the matrix, call this the, uh, call this the row 1, A1, row 2, A2, up to row, how many did we say we had? We had n, row n, A n. Okay, so the dimension of this guy is going to be, again, a, a vector, okay? It's going to be again a vector. Just like here, when we did this, we had a matrix operating on a column vector on the right gave us a column vector. This is, you could say, a matrix operating on a row vector where the matrix is now from the right and the, the row vector is from the left is going to give us another row vector. Okay. What's this row vector going to be? It's going to be a linear combination of the rows. So this row vector is x1, this x1, times a1, plus x2, times a2, plus xn, times an. Okay. So it's a linear combination of the rows. So this was now when we, so what I'm saying is left multiplying by a row vector gives you a linear combination of the rows. Okay. So this row is a linear combination of the rows where these are the elements of the linear combination. Well, so now if you don't take now just a vector x here, so you take your, maybe I should have called this b, you know, I should have called this b to keep kind of the a and the b. So I should have called this b and b and b, okay? So now I will again put here the whole matrix A where I have here, I'll call this the first row of A and the second row of A up to the nth row of A. And this is now the first row of B, second row of B up to, we said we had the, um, the M rows of B. Okay. So the matrix multiplication now says that the I throw the I throw of the result, okay, is going to take the um, the I th row here and do a linear combination of all of these rows, okay? So I th row is lin com of all B rows. So before, when we multiply from the right, the jth column was a linear combination of all the a's column. Now, the i's row is a linear combination of all the rows. Okay, so that's way three. I'm going through these a bit fast, but you need to explore them. And you know what you can do? I'm sorry, I have no noise in the stairway. Nothing I can do about it. Um,
nothing I can do. Okay, um, something I can do, not worth it. Okay, so you can actually try to implement this function with way two and with way three, which would be a different implementation. Um, some aspects of this might be part of your homework. Okay. Thanks, you guys are nice. You're even saying interesting. That's kind of cool. Okay, good. Uh, let's keep it this way. Let's go to way four. Way four. So for way four, we need to uh, define something else, which is very, very big in this course, the outer product. We had something similar already. What did we have similar to the outer product in terms of the way it sounds? We didn't have an outer product. We had, I mean, we spent a good hour on it, not the outer product, but the, we had the, we had the inner product, right? Now we're doing the outer product. Okay, remember inner product is, is this is inner product. Row times call equals number, this is, inner product. Outer product, column times row. Okay, column times row. Let's just look at this. Let's say that this column is n by one and this row is one by n. What's gonna be the dimension of the resulting matrix if I just do this column times row, n by one, one by n, what's it gonna give me? n by n. I'm gonna get a big matrix, okay? Now, this matrix is called the outer product. Now, this, this matrix is a big waste of space, big waste of space, because you only have two n entries, but now you're using n squared, right? Your input data was two n, now you use n squared, yeah? If n equals 10, you only had 20 numbers, 20 numbers, how many numbers we have here? We have 100, big waste of space. We don't do it for the data purpose. We do it for um, understanding the data purposes and also actually for compression purposes, you'll see. So sometimes we actually wanna go kind of the other way, okay? But what I'm saying, first of all, think of an outer product, you should be like in pain. Oh my God, I've got two n entries and I've suddenly got n squared entries, okay? And it's a matrix product between a column and a row. That's what you call an outer product, okay? There's a different name for an outer product, which will make sense a whole, uh, in about a week or two. And it's called a rank one matrix. Okay. So it's actually called a rank one matrix because it has very little information. It, it only has like information, which is you can reduce it to one column. So it only has, because what it does is basically this outer product, if if this had the numbers one, two, three, and this had, or this had 10, 20, well, let me do 10, 100, and 1,000, okay? So what the outer product would do, let me just write the result for you and it'll kind of make sense. Uh, we're gonna get 10, 20, 30, 100, 200, 300, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. Okay, so this row is actually appearing here as a multiple of it. So it's actually, it's linearly dependent with the other one and it's appearing here as another multiple. And similarly, this column appears here and appears there after you rescale it by that number. So the ij entry of an outer product is just the product of the ith entry of this and the jth entry of that. So that's first of all an outer product. Now, interestingly, okay, questions about outer products? I mean, they're gonna play a central role in the course in many ways, okay? So it's the opposite from, by the way, also related to what's called the covariance matrix from a data science perspective, we'll see that. So. The uh, inner product takes two uh, vectors of the same dimension, gives you a number. The outer product takes two vectors, gives you whoo, a matrix, like inflated. Okay. Now, if you're now looking at the matrix A times the matrix, let me again draw these a bit nicer. Let's draw the matrix A times the matrix B. And you have here the resulting matrix, okay, C. Then 
it actually turns out that you can represent C as a sum of outer products. Let's see if I can do this. So you can now take this row of A, the first row of A, and this first column of B. So let's actually give these names. Let's call this first row of A. Let's just, I, I mean, I could have called it like A, um, ideally, I, you know, a good name for that, that wouldn't be like, that would be fully defined, I'd call it A colon one. You know, that's like the first, sorry, did I say row? The first column of A, the first column of A, first column of A. Because could have said like A colon one, but let's not do this. Let's just, let's just do, let's just call it A one. Okay, and the second one here, let's call it A2, etc. And this one, let's call it B1. The second one, let's call it B2, etc. So it happens that what we can do is we can actually take A1 times B1. And this, look, it's an outer product. It's an outer product of A1 and B1. Okay, and we can add to that a2, whoops, let me just keep same color. We don't want to change colors here suddenly. A2, B2, up to the last one. The last one here is going to be the inner dimension AM, and this is BM, AM, BM. Now this, this should be nice, I mean, this is nice. Why is this nice? Well, it's nice because the product C now, and, and you, can, you can work this out, you can see that this works by looking at the details of the matrix multiplication, just seeing how it works with the entries. Look, this guy here is a rank one matrix, it's an outer product. It's this column times this row. So it's one of those inflatable matrices, you know, it's kind of big, but it, it actually doesn't have much information. Okay. This other one here, thank you, Rob. You guys are like very supportive. This is like towards the end of the marathon. It's like, keep going. Yeah, come on, 20 more minutes. It's good. It's something to happen. Good. Okay, good. Okay, it's not always gonna be like this, all roses. Okay, it's gonna to be tough. No. Okay, so this one here, A to B2 is, um, the outer product of this guy and this guy. So it's also kind of, you know, just a little information matrix. And this is the last one. Okay. So that's, that's way four. So let's, questions about this so far? Uh, M times N squared, the same complexity. You, you, it doesn't run away from the complexity, but it's a representation. Um, so yeah, I guess you can say that n times n squared complexity. Uh, so there's a question about the complexity. I mean, your inner dimension, it depends. This is, this is I'm not sure. This is not, a, this is not a, a way to implement it per se, but it's a way to represent it. And the reason that it's, it's good to represent it is Imagine now that some of these later, imagine that these matrices were built in such a way, yeah, A1 is a vector, A1 is a vector. Mm -hmm. Imagine that there wasn't much information here, not much here, not much here, and you could only take the first few, you know, maybe the first two, the first three. This is what you would call a low rank approximation. And we'll get to that towards the end of the course in, in a way of how do you actually do this with matrices. Okay, so this is not, it's not so much about the complexity, it's about the, um, the, the different way of representing this. Um, is this building to PCA, Rob's asking? Yes, so PCA, which is related to SVD, comes from this general uh, idea of a low rank approximation of a matrix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. But this is so far just, all we're doing is multiplying matrices. So, the, the thing when we're doing PCA, so PCA, principal component analysis, uh, one of those things that you know, we'll explore towards the end, uh, we'll see it through SVD, is when you can restructure your matrices such that most of the informations are in this first few sums. Okay, so you only need a few vectors to actually know your whole data set. Yeah, that's really it. Okay, so in the few minutes left, I suggest, Let's actually try and let's try and implement this together. 
let's try and implement this this thing together and and it'll be like an alternative um well together together means i will implement but you could find my mistakes and um, hopefully it'll work so <coughs> in this implementation it's it's just to see that this other form of matrix multiplication works um, so I assume now you can see the, yeah, okay, you can see the desktop again. And so basically we're gonna make a second matrix multiplication here. Let's go maybe down here below, above identity matrix, which we might not get to today, but you know identity matrix, this review. We'll get to it next week, early next week. Um, so this is another way to implement. well, to implement and to view. Again, these implementations are not for the purpose um, um, so there's a question on the chat. I can't understand why most information is preserved this way. So all the information is preserved when you have the full sum, you'll see it, at least an example running. But if, if your matrix was reordered in a different way where you your final outer products were kind of negligible, then you could throw them away as an approximation. But we're not there. This is just motivating for what we'll talk about. Far towards the end of the course, by the end of semester. Towards the end. Okay. All right, so um, outer prod matrix prod. Okay, so this is outer prod matrix prod. So what does outer prod matrix prod need to do? So our internal, let's just, you know, let's 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 have our do it the same here. So this is just error checking. We got our n by m, p by q, and we want to check that m is p. Okay, so c is n by p. What are we going to loop on? How many how many summons did we have? I'll do a loop on for um, i in one to what? What? How many summons did we have? this outer product representation. M, right, so we have M. Loop on M, okay. So let's now take one outer product. So the way we do one outer product is we do the A um, colon I, this is, this, is, this is the Ith row of A, okay. And B, this is not the code yet, okay. B I colon, okay, this is I, let's not call it I, let's call it K, okay. Eighth row of I, eighth row, case column. Am I correct? Case column, what am I, I made a bit of mistake here? Uh, K, case column of A, case column of B. And I guess if I will do a colon k times b a colon, this should give me an outer product. These are just comments, okay? These here are just, let me just put it like that. Okay, so that's an outer product. So let's do C plus equals this outer product. Kth call of A and K row of B. K, uh, K, yeah, thank you. K call, but the indexing is correct, right? Thanks, God. Yeah. yeah, okay. So what we've done is this is C. All right. That's outer matrix prod. Let's see if this thing works. Okay, so let's make uh, A to B. Uh, look, we can do rand one, two, three of two by, um, uh, let's do a five by three. So what this is, just to make, so this takes, this is a matrix that se ra selects random entries from the entries one, two, and three. Or let's just make it seven, 12, and 33. Okay, it selects random entries from this set and it's a five by three matrix, just so it's kind of nice. We see another something else, okay? Let's take B, the matrix of rand negative one, 
0 and 24. Maybe some more entries, 23, 52, whatever, 4, OK? And this one will be of dimension 3, say, by 10. Right? Can we, I mean, let's, let's see what the product of these two matrices are. A times B. This is 5 by 10 matrix. Let's try a function. Run, drum roll. Let's hope this thing works. Outer prod matrix prod. I don't know. A comma B. It takes a bit longer and it doesn't work. Um, nobody promised it will work. No method matching. Da, 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 da. Ta, ta, ta. Okay, so let's do a bit of debug. Let's do a bit of debug. So it doesn't work. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't work. I really don't. So let's, what I'm going to do for debug is I'll, I'll do here an at, we've got three minutes. So at show is a macro that just kind of shows you the entry. Colon K. Okay. So let's see what AK is. Let's see if, if this thing is doable before. So it's going to show something and then it crashed. Okay, so AK was this 733, uh, this row seven. Oh, okay. Okay, I see. So this is what happened here. So this is not an outer product. So you see, I thought this was a colon, a colon, a column, 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 uh, but it's actually like a, just an array. So what I want to do is I want to convert this second one maybe like that. And I think that's an outer product. Let's just see if that's how we do an outer product in Julia. So if I do one, two times 10, 100 dash. Yeah, that gives me the outer product. Okay, this is how I do outer product. So I need that dash there, okay. Is that a dash? No, apostrophe, dash, tag, not sure. I'll comment this show not to get a whole bunch of prints if this thing doesn't crash. Let's run this. To get the same numbers. Yeah, it did. Okay, so this worked. Now here it, it, it returned ints and here it returned floats. Okay, sometimes to see if something works, what you can do is you can do this minus a times b, and that's going to be a matrix which we'd like to be very close to zero. And you can even do a norm, and this is going to be way at the end of the course, okay, way at the end of the course, but it'll be like you know, you can do normal, it's a matrix norm. Um, so if a matrix norm of zero is zero, okay, so it's kind of check. Okay, um, so John asked a very good question. What's the purpose of defining uh, the four types just for calculation? So actually not at all for calculation. So the actual calculation of matrix multiplication is much more complicated like the, the algorithm that's used kind of in performant algorithms. But we don't need to do that. That was written in the 1980s when these very smart people wrote LA pack. And you know, not, no, no need to do it. So it's actually using block matrices and it, it's all about memory locality. So you don't want to do calculations with big matrices that things run out of cache and you all the time have to kind of look them up. Okay, the purpose of doing that is actually there'll be different representations of deeper linear algebra that we'll look at that will relate to these representations. Like this last one that has to do with the sum of outer products is already kind of interesting because we can maybe if, if we would reorganize our matrices in a certain way, such that some outer products are not important, we could throw them away. So it's, it's, it's building to the future. Other last minute questions? Thanks for today's lecture. Are there, ex are there exercises that go with VMLS? Yeah, the VMLS has exercises. Just look at the, at the exercise in VMLS. Um, could you recommend us some reading materials which link math with machine learning, search PCA? I have taken Emma. Oh, so, I mean, the whole second book for reading material, I mean, this whole course is designed to, to have like, these are all, you could spend 
a whole lot of time on this data science use cases. And we'll get to the first one next week, which is clustering, which I actually did with Math 7501. So some of you have seen it, but we'll get back to it too. And then we'll do the convergent proof of the perceptron, et cetera. So these are kind of data science applications. And more questions? I think I'll learn more math to better understand how. Okay. Guys, so uh, it's been nice seeing you or not seeing you. Um, I'll try to put this recording on. I hope this works. I'm sure it will. Um, next time we need to take a break. And uh, so your next interface is the practical. Of course, if, if some of you were overwhelmed from all of these things we did, this is, this is kind of beyond the level to quickly kind of code, right? But you will get homework exercises that require you to do these types of things, okay? So see you next Monday. And I, I might see all of you in the prac. I might be involved in the practicals uh, Thursday. Bye-bye. <laughs> Passion fruit is in season. Okay. <laughs>